Good morning and welcome uh, to the 25th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, I, I would ask everyone, as you usually do at this, at this, at this point, to switch off mobile phones and, uh, as they can often in interfere with the sound system. You will also note, though, that uh, we are using uh, um, um, uh, tablet devices instead of uh, you know, our, our uh, hard copies of our papers. Um, uh, we have an, a, an apology this morning for Rhoda Grant, who can't be with us. Uh, there is no substitute in place. Uh, first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation with two negative instruments before us. Mm -hmm. The first instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment No. 2, Order 2015, SSI 2015 backslash 266. There has been no motion to annul, uh, and the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any recommendations on the instrument. Uh, is there any comment from, from members? There is no comment from members. Uh, do I take it from that that the committee had agreed to make no recommendations? Thank you for that. The second instrument is the Public Bodies Joint Working Integrating Integration Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment No. 3, Order 2015, SSI 2015-321. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, is there any comment from members? No comment. Um, can I take it from that that the committee had agreed then to make no recommendation? Okay. Thank you. The third instrument is Self-Directed Support Direct Payments Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-319. There has been no motion to annul. Uh, 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 and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, m has made no rec uh, any comment on the instrument. Uh, do the members have any comment on the instrument? No? I take it from that, then, that the committee has agreed to make no recommendation. Thank you. We now move to uh, agenda item number two, which is, to, uh, uh, to, is our fourth evidence uh, session on the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill. Uh, and uh, we welcome uh, with us this morning Christine Lang, uh, Patient Advice and Support Service National Coordinator, Citizens Advice Bureau. Welcome. Dr Robert Henry, MS, M MPS, uh, Medical Director, Medical Protection Society. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Alison Britton, convener of the Health and Medical Law Committee, the Law Society of Scotland. And we also are expecting uh, uh, Pete, Peter Walsh, Chief Executive Action Against Medical Accidents, who's with us this morning, who has, I think, had some difficulties in his, his travel. So he's, he's due to be with us, and we expect him to, to join us. Um, is there no, uh, we, are, there is, uh, we don't expect any opening statements at this stage, and um, uh, in the interest of time, we'll move directly to questions, if that's OK, and I call Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Convener, and um, I, my question really is addressed to Professor uh, Britton, um, because whilst I support the sentiment behind the duty of candour, um, I'm grateful to Professor Britton for providing... Uh, in written evidence, an indication of some of the potential problems. And I wonder if she could elaborate a bit on those or just reiterate some of those. Um, the committee will remember that in a previous session I mentioned the analogous situation of uh, road accidents where if anybody's, um, any driver is uh, unwittingly or caught up in a road accident, if you read the small print of your insurance, it will tell you uh, strictly that you do not admit liability and, it, and it, it strikes me there is some degree of analogy there but uh, could you just perhaps touch on some of the potential pitfall, pitfalls of this legislation? Well, 
try, Miss McKenzie. Um, I suppose it would be logical then to start with the, the first question, and that would be asking about the necessity of the legislation. What would legislation of this nature bring to um, the situation that isn't already there? Um, and what is already there is probably two, two things. A long-standing professional ethical duty to have a good dialogue with one's patients or those that you're caring for and to build a relationship of trust. And I think without good communication, good dialogue and a relationship of trust, the practice of medicine and healthcare and social care just doesn't operate at all. So maybe the, the, the first question is, what does this legislation bring that maybe isn't already there? Um, so I, I suppose that would be my first question there. Um, the second observation, um, which I hope is helpful, is that if this legislation comes into effect under its, its current proposals, I think it brings with it a dilemma. Um, it's aimed at organisations, but I think it's almost impossible for those organisations to discharge the obligations in this bill or even try and implement the processes in this bill without involving individuals. The provision of health care is not um, undertaken by an organisation, it's undertaken by individuals. And I think that raises maybe a modern dilemma for any organisation, that on the one hand, you are trying to encourage the individuals that you employ to be compassionate, to engage with the individuals that they're caring for, and to be emotional as into their um, circumstances. So that's one duty I would hope any good organisation has. But the other organisation, which is perhaps more of a modern invention, is to discharge compliance as well. Process, procedure, parameters under which perhaps the first range of duties have to operate. And I think that can be very challenging to operate these in tandem. Do you think the effect of... Well, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I would entirely support what Professor Brisson has been saying. I think it's terribly important at the outset, I think we make clear that as a, an organisation that supports doctors, uh, MPS absolutely uh, supports uh, our culture of openness uh, and transparency and honesty when things go wrong. Uh, and I think our concerns very much echo the comments uh, Professor Brisson just made about the... Will will the legislation actually add to that culture of openness that we're trying to support, which we do through educational processes, or will it simply add a sort of bureaucratic burden uh, uh, and become a box-ticking exercise to actually have the opposite effect of that which we would want uh, in, in producing a culture of openness? Yeah, I mean, I take, I take, I take both those points and... Uh, you know, the suggestion that the legislation as it stands may have a contrary effect, but having listened and read carefully the other evidence, it would suggest that this culture of openness and transparency, whilst it might be quite common, is not as common as it ought to be. And therefore, could you suggest a way the, um, the, that we could perhaps have an a, a improved um, uh, way of addressing the obvious problem without giving rise to the legal concerns and the pitfalls that you've helpfully pointed out. I think that's one for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much. When we survey our members, there is still quite a culture of fear within the staff within the health service at all grades, I think, that uh, despite the fact we've talked about trying to have a a no-blame culture within NHS Scotland, that that has not yet been achieved. And I think the way to get that is, is, is through some, well, educational uh, works. I think, again, as people uh, like uh, the um, patient safety uh, organisations have said, it's about changing cultures within the organisation where staff feel comfortable coming forward where something has gone wrong and being absolutely open uh, and honest about it and to look for ways of uh, learning from it, changing it. And I think rather than imposing 
more duties, and I think it, it becomes even more of an issue when we get on to talk about willful neglect proposals. I think having a statutory duties people may not fully understand, but again, as Professor Britton points out, it actually falls back on the individuals, although it was the legislation as drafted is designed for bodies. It's the individuals who have to actually ensure that they comply with it. And I think if there's a misunderstanding, particularly with some of the more junior staff, perhaps, or people who are, who are less experienced, that are anxious that they may be breaching some of their statutory obligations, that actually that adds to that culture of fear and anxiety that they might be disciplined, that they might be subject to regulatory uh, uh, sanctions or whatever. Uh, so that really I think what we're saying is that adding legal obligations to people that they may not always fully understand isn't ideal. What we do say, and I think parts of the bill go some way to pro uh, addressing it, is around the idea of support in education for staff that, that may be involved in this. And I think if we do go, if, if it is the government's will to, 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 to put legislation in place around a statutory obligation uh, of candour, that I think the really important stuff will be around some of the definitions, because I think we can get into some of that in more detail. Some of the definitions are a bit loose at the moment, so people may not understand it. I think also the training and support mechanisms that are put in place or the organize, NHS organisations are obliged to put in place will be extremely important. Thank you. Convener, just, just a quick follow-up. See if there's any other no. witnesses who wish to respond. You need that's, to give them time there. That's respond. exactly my point, Convener. Yeah. I think um, just an additional point. You, you asked about possible solutions. Um, and I think just to follow through, but the idea of, of education, I agree. We, we need to give people... Um, an opportunity to understand the implications of the legislation because it's not going to be effective if they don't understand the implications. And our understanding of this legislation and the impact there would be that it's changing thresholds of what harm, definitions of harm and possible outcomes of harm. So you're either changing the thresholds in some circumstances or lowering them and I think it would be very important that everybody involved in this legislation would have to understand that. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, in, in relation to willful neglect, you may be criminalising um, behaviours which have or might have um, occurred, the, the near-miss scenario. So if this legislation goes through, I think being able to impart that information about changing the thresholds the um, extent of those thresholds and the possibilities of now criminalising some behaviour or near misses, I think getting that information imparted to the, the relevant organisations and individuals would be, that would be an important part. Would you say that it's uh, uh, my, my concern that it may take 10 or 20 years for the courts to deliberate over some of this stuff before we would really have clarity in, in terms of what it, exactly it means? I think that perhaps we're going to be looking at definitions and I suppose this would not be the only piece of, of legislation that the better the definition, the less you're leaving for either A, satellite legislation or regulation to come through or, I agree, deliberation by the courts to interpret what is meant by a triggering event, to interpret what is meant by um, unintended or unexpected consequences. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thanks, Mike. Is that a supplementary, uh, yeah. Dennis? It does indeed. A, a short supplementary then from Dennis. Yeah, it's very short, and I hope so. I hope it's uh, directed um, to Dr. Henry. It was when you were raising the, the issue about education support. I wonder if the codes of practice that we have at the moment, in some areas, the there's there's no sort of uh, definition or, or or regulation in terms of supervision how often it should happen do you think we should have a mandatory code within codes of practice for nursing and doctors and everyone else say because it isn't social care um for mandatory supervision rather than going to a statute thank you i think i think that is a good idea because i think uh, uh, clarifying what the expectations are and we've seen some examples i think quite recently with some concerns in some health board areas of the levels of supervision that have been given to juniors. Uh, I think 
where where openness uh, uh, and uh, clarity with patients where things have not worked out as we would have wished work best is in well-functioning units uh, where they're well managed and there's a, a, a good culture uh, where that uh, become may become more of a problem I think is and where some of this concern uh, particularly amongst junior staff of a fear of uh, uh, getting into getting into trouble is often where there's poorer levels of supervision uh, where uh, there's there's a poorer learning culture if you like in existence and I know in social work I think they have been probably further ahead sometimes in actually addressing some of these issues I think the point you make is is, is absolutely right okay. is, is, is it the key I don't know where I picked up yesterday just for a clarification is is that not already the situation in Northern Ireland where those responsibilities are mandatory we can maybe check. I, I think we picked it up in a discussion. Uh, 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 it was suggested in a, a discussion yesterday when we were um, uh, speaking with practitioners. But we can get that checked. Bob? Yeah. Thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, can I just start by putting a, a brief wee statement on the record um, in relation to a, a, a session that, that um, our committee members had uh, in private with a uh, Scottish Infected Blood Forum, Haemophilia Scotland and the Hep C Trust in relation to what their thoughts were on duty of candour within within this bill. I, I know that the members there uh, who attended it, including myself, found it incredibly uh, helpful and quite powerful, some of the evidence. We hope to have a, a short note, which will, will be available in relation, not a minute of that meeting, but a short note in terms of some of the themes that come up from that meeting. That will certainly help us in our deliberations. I just want to thank all involved for sharing their stories um, uh, last week in relation to that. So I just wanted to put that on the record before I, I move to questions. I kind of want to return a little bit to where Mike McKenzie started about whether the duty of candour is, is needed or not, because we seem to kind of gloss over that fairly quickly and questioned that without really scrutinising it, I thought, in any, any great detail. So I'm just referring to things that, that do exist at the moment. So health and social care professionals have got ethical requirements to discharge uh, uh, and disclose where there's instances of harm have, have taken place. Health and healthcare professionals issued a joint statement last year in relation to duty of candour and understand doctors and nurses, perhaps others, have got candour requirements within their professional standards. So I'd leave that sitting slightly to one side and maybe actually, um, I think it was Dr Henry or, or was it actually maybe Dennis Roberts in the supplementary talked about uh, social care staff being a bit further ahead in relation to some of this than others. And it left me thinking there's maybe a well-intentioned uh, if you like spaghetti approach to what is a duty of candour and when it should be applied, when it shouldn't be applied what is an ethical duty, what is a statutory duty, and when it should kick in and when it shouldn't kick in. So whilst we have all these examples of when a duty of candour would either be required or at the very least best practice and ethical, I'm left <coughs> slightly confused as to whether it's consistently applied across the health sector, across the social care sector, or even together as we move towards, like, for example, health and social care integration for older people, at least, and for other services as well. So um, I'm just wondering some reflections on whether, although all these duties or best practice exist, is there consistent application of what duty of candour is, when it should be triggered and what it actually means? And is there an opportunity to bring some certainty to that for health and social care professionals? Right. Certainly from our clients' experience, um, making complaints to different health boards throughout Scotland, there's inconsistencies, certainly in the way that the health boards respond to these complaints. Some of health boards are excellent at giving clients full explanation of what's gone wrong and what's happened, um, and they explain the changes they will make to make sure this doesn't happen again, um, and the training they will give to staff if that's appropriate. Other health boards are much less good at doing that and explaining 
they either don't fully explain to the client what's happened or they're unable to give an apology. Um, again, perhaps because they're the fear of litigation. Um, so there are great inconsistencies, certainly from our client's experience. Anyone else? <laughs> a, a reflection more than anything else. I, I, I would imagine that most people working in the caring professions understand what duty of candour means, that idea of dialogue, openness, trust, accountability, um, just, just where we started our, our discussions there. Um, consistency, however, I think must be a very difficult thing to do. And perhaps that's why initially it would have been professional organisations um, that put forward um, practices, guidelines, in order to be able to exercise that within the profession. Um, but modern medicine and modern healthcare, you're looking much more now at a multidisciplinary approach. So in, in, in treating an individual, you could have nurses, community nurses, social, um, social um, workers, community workers. And because duty of candour might be quite amorphous, it might mean different things to all of them and whether or not they had actually met that or not. So trying to find a consistent approach that one size fits all um, is, is, is certainly going to be a challenge there. Okay, Dr. Hendricks, would you want to add? Yes, yes. I can just thank you. Just make a comment. I would, I would agree with Christine. I think there is undoubtedly variation from board to board, uh, but we see that in a whole lot of other areas around uh, health, uh, health service management in Scotland. And I think again comes back to what we're saying about the, the culture within that health board area or that organisation, the quality of management that allows uh, things to be done. And I suppose ultimately the scrutiny that the boards make of how patient complaints, patient concerns are dealt with. And I'm, again, I'm not sure that the, the legislation would actually uh, get more consistency uh, because, again, I suppose that comes back to how the, the, uh, any new statutory obligations would be monitored. And I think the suggestion is it was HIS, Health Improvement Scotland, be doing it. Again, would, would this assist them in a, a, improving and getting a consistently improved performance across health board areas or not? You would have to ask them. Uh, again, I think, uh, as I say, a lot of it comes back to the quality of management and quality of setting the culture which comes from the top. Can, can Mark, can, can, is it useful at this point just to reflect the discussion no, that we had yesterday and, 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 and the clinic uh, uh, of the concern about the clinical practice, the day to day, not on the adversarial, but you know, and, and you know, the, the consultant yesterday and uh, uh, her concern, Malcolm, is it? Well, um, I mean, they, they could be raised. I mean, I was, I was, I was actually wanted to take up um, a question to accident against um, medical accidents to explain we're having quite a lot of criticisms at the moment of the duty of candour. Where obviously, your paper is the is a core document in terms of the background to this and why. So I, I was wanting to ask you about that, but perhaps you want me to do that in a little moment or two. Right. Um, but uh, no, I think what, what the convener re was referring to there, and I'm reporting her views rather than necessarily agreeing with them, but it was put to us, and Peter Walsh will want to respond to this when I question him later. But uh, she, well, I, I suppose one of the most interesting things that she was saying was that s some people don't want t to be informed. Uh, but I suppose that was the key thing I remember. Your memory of this may be more detailed than mine, convener, but uh, it was certainly a strong view from a clinician that uh, this was not going to, that there were a large number of patients who wouldn't uh, want to be informed in these circumstances. Although I, I wondered myself when I was listening whether there is a different situation when it's end of life care than, than, than other situations. But that, that would be my reflection on what she said. But. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I think Bob's going to hit a, a, a final question. So, so it's, it's just, I'm still, I, I think, I thank the witnesses for their answers. And, and what I, can I, maybe it's my fault that I'm confused here. And I apologise for my confusion. But the replies I got, with the exception of Ms. Lyme, who I thought was quite clear, the other replies spoke about we need needing greater consistency and would legislation actually add to cultural change. And if you like, my question was about clarity rather than consistency and cultural change. So, for example, uh, this bill, OK, the, the, in the face of the bill, it's fairly straightforward and uh, the opportunity 
is and what the guidelines and the guidance will, will show and, and training that may flow from that. But I don't have any clarity under all these different requirements that exist just now about if, and I'm sorry to give some very small examples where the duty of candour may never kick in, but I use them for simplicity purposes. So an elderly person in a care home setting who's been assessed in meeting two people for moving and handling, or in a hospital ward, assessed needing two people for moving and handling, and there's a continence issue or whatever, and one person, because they don't want to wait for that second person, decides, I'll have a go at that myself, and there's a fall, and there's a significant incident. That's certainly... The family might want to see some transparency and openness in relation to that. Whether it triggers a duty of candour requirement or not, I don't know. But the point I'm making is there's a living, breathing example that probably happens in our communities. Um, similarly, um, drug errors do happen in hospitals and in nursing homes, not through any willful neglect, just because human error is, is just part of being human. And it's whether or not there's any guidance or clarity at the moment about where that human error occurs, about what the requirements are in relation to the, the nursing staff or whoever who administered that particular drug. So I'm giving two examples where maybe it's at such a, within reason, it's at a relatively low level where the high-end duty of candour might never kick in, but I'm left with no clarity at all, irrespective of what the professional codes may say for doctors, may say for nurses, may say for care staff, may say for allied health professionals, as to when the ethical and and requirement within the professional codes actually kicks into real life examples for when a duty of candour or openness and transparency should be employed. Is there not an opportunity? And there may be significant issues coming on how you define, how you trigger. I get all that. But just in terms of the opportunities within this legislation to define better and to provide better clarity, because I don't see how we can ever get the cultural change properly we need or the consistency that we need unless we decide what the baseline is to derive consistency from. Sorry, I went on a bit there, convener, no, but I think no, it's important. That's okay. That's, okay. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's fine. Um, we're delighted now to have Peter Walsh with us, who had some transport uh, problems. Uh, we, Peter, you, 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 you want to come in with a bang and get your, <laughs> your, your, your question I think it'll be okay. Is that working? That yeah, yeah, good. Um, if I could just respond to those last two points. Um, uh, in terms of clarity, first of all, on the professional ethical duties uh, for doctors and nurses, uh, it is pretty clear that there's a duty ethically and professionally to tell patients or their next of kin uh, about any unintended, unexpected incident that's caused any level of harm. So it's a more all-embracing duty than the statutory duty that we're talking about today. Um, and it's basically what any of us would expect. Any, any decent health professional, if they know something's happened that uh, may have caused harm, leave alone is known to have caused harm, you'd want to tell someone about it. I think what's really exciting and different about the statutory duty of candour is that it's uh, applying to organisations collectively and uh, corporately. And it's dealing with a situation, as you said, that things do go wrong uh, and there will always be some incidents that happen that should have been avoided, that are unexpected, unintended. Um, but what also goes on and has done for the whole history of the NHS and beyond is that there's, on occasions, um, been a lack of honesty. Um, at the worst extreme, there's been de quite deliberate and callous cover-ups and anyone who works in the health service or in social care will tell you it does happen. What's been the situation in the past? People have been talking about culture. The culture has been one where, in effect, the system has frowned upon such behaviour of a lack of honesty, a lack of openness, but it's tolerated it. And this piece of legislation, uh, I think, will be the final piece uh, uh, that will complete the Scot Scottish approach to patient safety. Um, it's a missing segment at the moment, but one that says that unequivocally a lack of openness and honesty when harm has been caused or is suspected to have been caused is not tolerable. Um, and there are definitions. Um, I, I would like to summarise the definitions as any significant harm, uh, and uh, not only harm that's known already to have occurred, 
but has uh, the potential to develop or is suspected. Um, on the point about people, some people not wanting to know, I think that is a, a very valid point and one has to respect each individual's wishes. When the discussions took place in England about their version of the duty of candour, uh, we made this very same point. And the way that they've dealt with it uh, in England is that there is a requirement to actually tell the patient or service user or their family that there is something to report, to discuss. But they can simply say, well, thanks very much, but I do not want to know. You know, um, let's say mum, dad has passed away, we're moving on, and we don't want to know another thing. And that's their absolute right. But it's not the right of any individual health professional or organisation to make that decision for them that they don't need the opportunity to know. Any other responses, Bob? Okay. Malcolm? Well, that was very helpful for that. Thank you. I suppose I was interested in the submission from accident against medical accidents because it, because it gave some background to this. Um, I think we're aware that this has been legislated for in England and we see behind that the mid-staff's inquiry, but, but you say in your submission, Mr. Walsh, that you've been campaigning for this for 20 years. So I think, you know, so I don't think this has just come from nowhere. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Scotland um, um, copying things from England if we think they're good policies, but obviously the Scottish version of it is different as well in some ways. And I suppose the other interesting thing about your submission is in the kind of way you're suggesting some amendments to the proposal in Scotland. For example, I suppose you're concerned about enforcement uh, because um, there's there's a care quality commission in England that has some powers to ensure that it's enforced whereas perhaps it's not so clear you know what's going to happen in Scotland in that. so I, I would be interested in a little bit about the background to it and I suppose you know a, a couple of things where you would like to see the detail of the proposal changed and I'm sure others will want to give a different perspective on this but I think it's good to hear from Mr Walsh because the, the discussion before you came was very much dominated by a critique of what's proposed, so it would be useful to get, obviously, a balance to that from yourself. Yes, um, uh, certainly. And in terms of background, um, it's perhaps an opportune time to pay tribute to the family of Robbie Powell. You might be aware that some people, in fact, our original campaign for a duty of candour, we gave the title of Robbie's Law. Um, this is because of a, the death of a 10-year-old in Wales, South Wales, and the absolutely heroic efforts of the family to get openness and transparency. There was an alleged cover-up uh, in Robbie's case. Uh, there was negligent treatment, but the reason it's significant for today's discussion is the alleged cover-up and the fact it established that there was no statutory or legal obligation to be open and honest when things go wrong. As I said earlier, the system frowns on cover-ups. Nobody would approve of that kind of behaviour, of course. Uh, however, it's been tolerated for decades. Um, so for decades also, people have resisted the notion of a statutory duty. Uh, people have argued that uh, somehow it would have the opposite of the desired effect, that somehow it would get in the way of an open, fair culture. Um, there was a lot of resistance in England before uh, eventually uh, the government in Westminster accepted the the pressing need after the Mid-Staffordshire inquiry, which looked at the arguments for and against in some copious detail. Um, and since it's been adopted as policy in England, I have to say that those people who were uh, the opponents of any notion of making this statutory actually enforceable have moved on. Uh, it's been very well received on the whole, um, and people are getting on with putting things into practice. After all, if everyone preaches openness and honesty and doing the right thing, what possible problem could there be in that being put in statute? No one's argued, incidentally, or certainly we haven't argued, that actually passing a piece of legislation or regulation will in itself change culture um, in the same way that having legislation about, uh, anti about discrimination on, ba uh, on grounds of race or uh, creed or disability Having that piece of legislation on its own doesn't change the culture, but it underpins a change in culture that society demands. And so what you will be doing by passing this legislation is sending the, the clearest message 
that bad behaviour in terms of a lack of openness will no longer be tolerated um, and there will be measures in place to actually make sure that the right things happen. Uh, of course, there's going to be a need for training, awareness and support for staff in doing the right thing. And I'd like to say that far from necessarily having to uh, copy England, there's a great opportunity here for Scotland to get this right in a way that England hasn't yet entirely done. Um, there are some, uh, some mistakes, if you like, or some omissions in the original English approach which you have the opportunity of ironing out. And most fundamental in all of those is making sure that by the time the legislation comes in, there's a, a coordinated, planned and resourced programme of awareness raising, training and support for the staff who are responsible for implementing it, which sadly is still not happening south of the border, but we're, we're certainly hoping it will do very, very soon. Uh, in terms of enforcement, it is an important point. Um, I think the public in Scotland will be saying, well, this is all very great, but it's motherhood and apple pie. Of course we expect openness and honesty. What actually happens if health boards don't comply with this or if a GP practice don't comply with this. Now, I, I've had a very helpful meeting, I have to say, with Scottish Government officials where they've explained the differences in the system of regulation and monitoring, etc., in Scotland compared with England and the rest of the UK where we work. Um, and what might seem a sort of just throwaway line in the legislation about Scottish ministers uh, having the ability to, um, to report which on the face of it, to the layperson, you read that and say, really, is, 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 that, you know, is that the consequence of failing to comply, that you're named and shamed in the report? Of course, that wouldn't be adequate. But I think if it's made clear to the public and indeed service providers that actually this, this really is uh, a serious matter, that boards have to sit up and take notice, otherwise the consequences that will follow through ministers will be serious, then you've got the right situation. Now, of course, we hope they, those measures never have to be used because the aim of this is to change culture and practice uh, for the good, and this is underpinning that. But it, it is an important ingredient, I think, to have um, the, um, um, the, the adverse consequences should people decide not to comply to really make this meaningful. Professor Brett. I'm still thinking about um, the Deputy Convener's question about what will it add in terms of consistency and um, we've, we've now obviously alluded to, mm. to the position in England as well and I think our view would be is we simply don't know. The position in Regulation 20 which deals with the duty of candour in English has been so recently introduced <clears throat> we just don't know. Um, and I would have to say that it's not my understanding that it has been universally embraced and accepted by all. Um, my, my reading and, and, and evidence would show that there are still uh, reservations, concerns, um, but clearly, um, given the legislation has passed, one would want to, to do the best. Coming back in a year's time and asking that question, I think we'd have a much clearer idea of the position in England. And as you correctly pointed out, um, NHS in Scotland is um, a, a slightly different beast to, to what we're dealing with um, in England. But I don't think we should also confine ourselves to the position in England. I think we should be looking internationally. What can we learn from our colleagues elsewhere? And it's my belief that that has not yet been done. Because these concerns, these issues uh, of duty of candour, how we interact with people that we are caring for, these must be universal considerations. So we're at this point, we have this legislation, we're not clear of the outcomes uh, and the consequences of the passing of the English legislation. Perhaps we should still be looking for evidence uh, elsewhere to get a clearer idea of whether, um, as Mr Doris says, it is possible to draft something that does pick up the nuances of the, the diverse nature um, of our healthcare professions. I think it is, it's for that very reason that health and social care have evolved in terms of policy, guideline, regulation, bespoke to their own practices because duty of candour, whilst recognised, is such an amorphous concept. 
Doctor uh, Henry. Yeah, so just again, there was interesting what Peter said because actually there's some overlap. I think because we're probably trying to achieve. Peter, I've talked about this before. Stuff, but there are some some concerns. Certainly, our experience in England, I think Peter touched on it, is that so far there's little evidence of the educational and the support being put in place. And there's certainly, we've certainly, particularly amongst general practitioners in England, had feedback that they don't really understand what their duties are. Uh, they are anxious about CQC, because again, very different in England from, from the Care Quality Commission. Uh, there is a fear uh, or that, they, that they cannot dis discharge their duties properly. So I think there is, you know, if, if this is going ahead, it, I again underscore the importance of proper support and education around it. And I suppose ultimately what slightly concerns me, and again, is the idea of there will be tough enforcement, something bad will happen to people if they fall foul of the legislation. That, I think, A, it's going to be difficult to enforce, but if the perception amongst the healthcare and the social care community is that this is yet another burden that's being added, that they may, something bad may happen to them rather than it encouraging people to do exactly what we hope they would. Uh, 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 it me. Because a scandal at the end of the day is a scandal. Would this legislation really have stopped Midstaffs or Morecambe Bay or some of the other problems? Would that, or would that just be yet another aspect to the scandal that not only had they breached common decency, let alone any professional obligations, but they would have breached the statutory duty as well? I'm just anxious that it... It may be a, a, a proposed solution to something uh, that, that wouldn't have the effect. Welcome. Well, that, that was all extremely helpful. Can I bring in um, uh, Christine Ling, if possible, because you, you have some extra suggestions about, I, mean, I think you're supportive of the, of the duty of candour, but you feel it's important that there should be support available, uh, which would be interesting to hear about. But you also have a reference to the... Um, to the uh, public service ombudsman. So again, if, uh, I don't know whether that partly answers the question about what recourse people would have and so on. But yeah. um, we would be would we certainly welcome that if this is, is introduced, that people are directed towards um, independent advocacy and also the help available through the patient advice and support service um, delivered by Citizens Advice Bureau throughout the country. Um, we would certainly welcome the training mm -hmm. as well for NHS staff, is certainly around the area of complaints and early resolution. Um, when people are dealing with that in hospitals and health centres, I think there's still a long way to go with that. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that people are made aware that if this is going to happen, if they are going to be, um, as Peter is saying, if people are going to be asked if that, if they would like information, that they're made aware that they can get support to get them through that process. It may be that somebody is available to be with them when they're given that news, or that if they then want to make a further complaint about it or find out more, they're supported through that process. And at the end of the day, um, I would also refer to the Patient Charter, um, which was introduced along with the Patient Rights Act, which states that patients have a right to be informed and involved in decisions about their care and treatment, um, to be treated with respect and dignity and the right to have a say about their care. And if they're not given the information fully about what's happened to them or where things have gone wrong, then I don't know how they would do that. So we would certainly welcome that, open it up, openness and honesty. That, that's all I've got on the duty of candour. Yes, are we still? I mean, at some point it would be good to get comments on ill treatment and open neglect. But do you want to keep on candour? At well, that? I can bring you back in uh, uh -huh. again, or you can continue with yeah. that. Well, I mean, I, I was really—it's really, I'm, it's really quite interesting because last week I would say most of the concerns were about ill treatment and willful neglect, whereas this week the balance has been very much about the duty of candour. So, it, I suppose it would be interesting, and some of some of you have covered it in your submissions, but. Uh, it would be interesting to just open up that other second big issue that we're looking to cover today. Um, I, can, I can see Peter Wall certainly um, uh, strongly um, supports it, but with some qualifications, so he may want to comment on those. But it would be just useful to get your general views on that second uh, area of potential controversy. Um, yes. Um we think, in principle, it, it has to be the right thing to, to have an offence of willful uh, neglect. Uh, we've all heard about some dreadful scandals, and I think there's a public expectation um, that there is uh, a strong line taken on this kind of unacceptable level of care. Uh, our concern simply lies around um, it being directed um, very carefully. Um, there's a danger of uh, overdoing this and actually punishing people 
who are put in an impossible situation. Uh, so our concern, and I understand that the policy intention is, uh, that this will capture the, the management, if you like, who oversee very, very poor standards and uh, not be targeted at um, uh, day to day staff uh, who may have been put in, a, in a, an impossible situation. Any other comment to that? How do we do that? Do, you know, how do we separate the individual from the organisation? I've got no particular um, expertise or wisdom to offer you uh, on that. Um, it's, it's really just a plea for us to see fairness uh, in the way that this is deployed. I think if you know, the other things we've been talking about, duty of candor and other elements of patient safety, are got right, um, then nobody wants this legislation or this offence ever to have to be used. That's, that's the end game. Um, but... Um, it's just about having safeguards about how it's, how it's approached. It's approached in a fair, sensible and proportionate way. Dr Henry. Thanks. Uh, I have to say we've got much more concern about the proposals for willful neglect as a criminal offence than the duty of candour. I think duty of candour, we're all trying to get the same place and there is the question, is this going to, to work? I think we've got really quite serious concerns. Well, firstly... Uh, it, it, it is, as drafted, focused on the individuals. And if we're talking about a culture within the health service where people are anxious about a no-blame culture, introducing a, a, a statutory duty that might end up with making prison, certainly I would suggest is going to not, it, it, not foster a, a, a culture of, of no fault, of, of no blame. Secondly, I mean, I think the question is, is it necessary... I mean, are we really saying that there are people at the moment getting away with these utterly unacceptable behaviours for want of a criminal sanction? I mean, <clears throat> absolutely unacceptable that people would willfully either mistreat uh, a, a person or, or, or willfully neglect them. But the, I would suggest that the uh, criminal, disciplinary uh, and other sanctions that are in place surely are... are, are uh, adequate to, to cover that um, and I think as I say the, the, f the concern that would actually fly in the face of what we're trying to achieve with the duty of candour legislation where we're trying to get people to be open, trying to get people to early, uh, early on in a situation be entirely transparent. If sitting with that you've got the threat of criminal sanctions and imprisonment surely that would, to my mind, would seem to be almost entirely counterproductive. So a piece of legislation that I don't think that there's, there's people getting away with it, if you like, the moment that we need to cover that with. Uh, secondly, then, you know, creating this, this, this climate of, of fear, I think would actually be counter to what we're trying to achieve through any legislation around duty of candour. So we have really fairly severe uh, concerns about, the, about that suggestion. Anyone else? Christine, Professor Britton. The, uh, the Society didn't uh, make any submissions on the area uh, of willful neglect. We focused as a health committee on the duty of candour because it had, we felt, a, um, a broader effect. So perhaps just a, a two things. Um, the Society would be happy to take this back and, and consider it now that there has been further deliberation <coughs> here. But perhaps a personal observation, and maybe it takes us back to um, the point that Mr Mackenzie made at the beginning, have to be very clear in um, the terminologies that we're using here. If we're using concept of willful neglect, uh, it has criminal implications and we should be very clear that we're not confusing that with a negligent act. In the law as it stands just now and the procedures that are available to us under um, Scottish and, and English law um, and neglect or negligence in a healthcare setting is an unintentional act or omission. An unintentional act. As soon as you're using the word willful, you're looking at the criminal concepts of it's premeditated, intentional or it has been exercised <clears throat> with such a degree of recklessness it could not be considered in any other way apart from within the criminal sphere. 
and personal observation there is this legislation would then make a proposal that somebody could be criminally investigated for a crime which may not have even occurred. It, you're back on this idea of near miss. Um, but as a society, we'd be, we'd be happy to take these concepts um, and, and develop them further, if that would be helpful to the committee. That would, I mean, um, in the definition of, of a willful act, I mean, you, you, you generally described it there a bit, but how would that, I mean, that description would be very, very important for people when working in that environment. How would we define a willful I don't think I'm qualified to give a, 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 a definition within a, a healthcare context, but normally what that would mean um, is a behaviour so so reckless or intentional or premeditated mm -hmm. that it could not be considered in any other forum apart from through the criminal law. Well, I've got... Uh, I don't... I had a show from um, Colin, uh, particularly about willful neglect. I just just to ask a question, Colin, because I'm I'm, I'm asking you a question before I let you in because I've got an. Uh, uh, in terms of the an almost vicarious liability um, aspect of this, in terms of how other you know, if you're in the, it doesn't matter. I'll I'll but come back. A, I'll I'm, put, I'm quite happy to take take. Uh, <coughs> Just go through my list, or if if there's anyone want to ask additional questions on the aspect of willful neglect, Mike. Just wondering if any of the witnesses feel that taken together these two aspects of this could result in a, a kind of risk aversion. Um, we've seen the manifestations of risk aversion. It was a high-profile case of a lady. I think she was a while that fell down a, a mine shaft, and that the fire brigade refused to rescue her because of health and safety concerns. We hear about carers who are unwilling to change light bulbs for elderly patients and so on and so forth. Is there a possibility that um, the the risk aversion that this gives rise to will lead to a situation where the cure is worse than the disease? Dr Henry and then Mr Wall. Thanks, happy to take that. I mean, I think I think you're right. That how this would be interpreted by the health care and social care community, I think it, it's difficult to predict. Uh, but the idea that you could go to your work, try to do the right thing, and then if circumstances turn out uh, in an unexpected way, that you could actually be looking at being prosecuted, having the police come round, ending up in a police cell. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the thing wouldn't even proceed. You might not even be, you know. Taken to taken to trial, but the very fact that the criminal justice system would be could be involved, I think it would need to happen once, and you, you know who you know the effect on, on the community could be could really be quite devastating. Is uh, as I say, if somebody genuinely sets out to cause harm, well, that's a very I would other than something like shipping or something like that, very very rare, uh, but absolutely should be dealt with. But it, you know I think can be adequately dealt with through the current criminal. You know, they'd be suspended, sacked, <laughs> prosecuted, and all the rest of it. Uh, but if there was in people's minds, and you know, uh, you know, if we are talking about cultural change, how people can sometimes get the wrong end of the stick or uh, exaggerate concerns and so forth. But if they thought working in what can often be a high stress, often an under-resourced, difficult environment, if they've got hanging over them, if something goes wrong here, I might end up in jail. Then one would fear that they would start to take either an appropriate action or simply give up. <laughs> you know, at a time when we're struggling to attract people into social care sectors and indeed into some medical sectors to make it uh, even more scary, the, you know, I, I think we'll, we would have a, we could have a potentially uh, devastating effect on, on, on the, the, the professions out of all proportion to any harm that would ever be saved. I'll just concentrate, if I may, on the duty of candour aspect of this. And the answer, I think, is absolutely not. There isn't any danger of, uh, of the effects you described of the duty of candour. After all, we're talking about basic humanity and ethics here, telling people the truth about something that's happened and may have caused them really significant harm or lead to significant harm. The other thing to remember, I think, about your statutory duty of candour proposals is that it's focused on the organisation 
and a really important obligation that it places on the organization, the employer, is that they are s required to support their staff, and that should come across really loud and clear. So it's actually the opposite effect. So it should p make people feel more confident that their organization has to step up to the, the plate and actually um, provide the environment and support the culture that's required to enable them safely uh, and humanely to actually fulfill what for most people is a professional obligation anyway. And the, and the last point about it is of course that um, not only is this about basic uh, ethical practice, patients' rights, and I think there should be some reference to this incidentally in the Patients' Rights Act. Um, it, it's a strange piece of legislation for this kind of thing to sit in, if you like. Uh, uh, maybe it could be cross-referenced as part of the patients' rights set out in the Patients' Rights Act. But not only is it you know, a grossly unfair, unjust for people to be denied the information about their own treatment or a loved one's treatment, but the organisations who are prepared to act in that way are precisely those organisations who uh, end up being the subject of a scandal. Um, the Mid Staffordshire's, the Morecambe Bay's, and, and, and many others that we've seen. Um, if you're not prepared to actually be open and honest with your patients who you've harmed, you're very unlikely to be an organisation that will learn lessons to improve patient safety. Um, so not being open and honest with patients or families is a scandal in its own right, in actual fact, and um, uh, dealing with it will also help patient safety and hopefully avoid uh, some of the other consequences that people are worried about. Any, any, anywhere else? Dr. Henry, you wish, wish to come just, back? Just really as a minor point of clarification, my answer to Mr. McKenzie was primarily focused on the willful neglect proposals. I wasn't suggesting people would end up in jail for lacking a duty of candour. I mean, I think there is an interesting issue, but, a much, le but much less around uh, the duties of candour. I think it's largely around people not being sure when the duty kicks in and when they should be doing stuff. I, I, I think the real fear uh, we have is around the, the wolf neglect stuff. Duty of candour, I think, uh, uh, is provided people are supported and properly educated and clear when they need to do it. I suppose the, the one burden that, that might come for patients is, you know, if, if you have an overly enthusiastic people who, you know, <laughs> tell everybody about every, every little thing that's going wrong. So that might be a slightly risk-averse behaviour. But the, the, the main answer I was giving to, to Mr McKenzie was really particularly directed at our concerns around willful neglect, not not an introduction of a duty of kind. Thank thanks, that, thanks for that. Dennis Robertson, uh, followed by Richard Lyon. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I just wonder if we can pursue this just a little further. Um, and I should state, convener, that I'm actually finding this a bit difficult to some extent, um, having looked at the case studies uh, provided uh, by Citizen Advice. Uh, I am the parent of a daughter who died, uh, uh, didn't recover from uh, uh, surgery. But we had to look at the pathway of care. And the thing I want to sort of maybe examine from you is it's an intentional aspect or maybe something that could have happened that didn't happen. It's not maybe neglect in itself, but un unintentional consequences to some extent. But when we looked at uh, the reasons behind my, my, my daughter's death, it was the whole pathway of that introduction into her care within the medical profession. And that was actually looked at um, independently and the outcomes. Now, when we get the outcomes, we know that they've changed the process and procedures. And we know that that's actually saving lives. So what I'm actually coming to is if we accept that there can be unintentional consequences, is it not a positive thing because it's a learning thing? Now, OK, th th there was in my own case, uh, a situation which we would hope never happens to anyone else. But um, from that, a lesson was learned and a positive outcome. So therefore, we actually accept that if, we're, if we look at what has happened and we're open and honest, we might not always, we might not always be satisfied as grieving parents uh, with the outcomes and answers, because it doesn't change the situation. But if we know that there's a positive outcome and a learning from that, is that not something that we should welcome? It's certainly something that our clients would welcome. I mean, a lot of the work that the patient advisors do with clients 
is around managing their expectations. What does the client want to gain from making a complaint? And often people are making a complaint just to start that dialogue, as you've obviously been able to have with the health professionals to find out what happened if something went wrong and if the outcome would have been different, if that had, something had been picked up at an earlier stage or something had been different. And certainly we would always want, you know, clients are very happy when they get an apology and when they're, they're ex <coughs> they get um, information about that lessons have been learned and this sharing sharing of what went wrong or best practice will be shared so that this won't happen again because a lot of them their main aim in coming to us is just they don't want this to happen to the next person if we would absolutely welcome anything that encourages that i think my point is that the legislation the statute perhaps doesn't change it may change it but what i'm saying is a process is already there that can be followed and i think that we can you know, we, we, we are reliant on the health professionals then to, to sort of reflect on what has happened and then have that engagement with family. Does that, is that not something that's sort of written in already within the health boards and is managed uh, in a maybe a satisfactorily way? As I say, as parents, we might not welcome all the outcomes, but what I'm saying is a learning thing. So it's already there. Do we need statute? to make it better. Could, could the panellists, um, yeah. if we wanted to come into the original question, you know, take, take, take both the questions at this point. So, uh, um, uh, Dr. Hendy, you, you wanted back in, and, and uh, Mr. Well, mm -hmm. and Walsh wanted back in. Yes, yeah, just, just briefly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to say I completely agree with what was, what was being said there, and it must be dreadful in that circumstance to be able to say, uh, to, to have to engage and think about it. And, but we would abs at NPS absolutely support this idea of openness, uh, developing uh, an ability to, to speak to bereaved parents in that circumstance and to make sure people learn from it. And if at all possible, nobody else has to go through the, 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 the awful circumstance. And we absolutely support that and would work and indeed do work with other organisations and educational classes and so forth we do ourselves to try to support that I suppose the question really for this committee is to decide will the statutory duty make that better or will it not will it inhibit it or will it be neutral I say I think there's arguments for and against we and perhaps at the end of the day we don't fully know around the duty of candor but I think that is obviously what you, you need to and your committee need to deliberate on and decide because ultimately I think we would all at this ta end of the table be agreed that where something like that does happen and there's an adverse outcome, that absolutely the family uh, need to understand what's happened, the staff need to be absolutely open, there needs to be within the organisation and at every level and I think as points been made on a number of occasions that medical care now is often very complex journey and involves a whole lot of people at different points in it um, and how, for proper learning you need to involve everyone to be open and and to, to move forward the question and the worry always is I suppose with legislation if it targets individuals that will that support the culture will it support the outcomes that we all want to see or will it will it just inhibit it and I I think the the, the jury's out perhaps in that Mr. Walsh. Well, the duty of candor, of course, doesn't target individuals. It's, it's focused on the organization, but it's absolutely our understanding, and we deal with thousands of families every year whose lives have been devastated by things going wrong in healthcare, that they need to see the kind of outcome that you described, uh, and that that's a great comfort to them. Most people just want the acknowledgement, the apology, learning to arise, at, for, to make it less likely to happen to someone else. And for the most part, of course, good organisations and good health professionals are doing this as part of their daily practice. However, we all do know as well that a small but significant minority of professionals and organisations don't operate in that way. Um, and so what the duty will do is not effectively say to people that that's an option. You know, you can either do good practice, we recommend you do, but if you don't, we'll tolerate it. This will make it much more likely that everyone will have a more constructive, positive uh, learning experience and resolution of their, um, their tragedy, their, their, their concerns. Um, and as I said earlier, if an organization is doing that, 
regularly, consistently, and they're not given an option of opting out, it's also more likely that they'll take that learning and actually go forward and change things. And unfortunately, at our organisation, we have seen those examples of where those discussions don't happen. And I have to tell you, as well as it having um, the organisational implications of not learning to, to make it less likely to happen again, the harm that's caused to families like yours when they've not been dealt with in the way that you were uh, can be as devastating as the actual harm in an unintended incident, patient safety incident. Um, so um, it's a win-win situation uh, if we actually get this right and support it in the way I think we'd all like it to be supported. Professor Blake. A, a, a brief comment in response to, to Mr Robertson's uh, very personal example. Uh, I don't think there could be any piece of legislation ever drafted which enhances the value of a personal apology and a sincerely given apology. I don't think we can draft anything that will ever replace that. I think the best that legislation or policy or regulation can do is perhaps look at the processes that accompany that. So an apology is given, but importantly, we review what happened at that time. We look at the process, can we stop it happening again? Can we put an action plan in? And we, within a healthcare setting, we, most boards uh, in Scotland now have protocols which will allow a personal apology to be given without admission of blame or liability, and in some cases also to look at practices and processes. So again, I think the question is what, just exactly what you've said. Will this legislation bring anything else, this legislation bring anything else that isn't currently there? And whilst an organisation can look at um, protocols and processes, an apology has to be an individual thing. I think having an organisation sending somebody in that perhaps has not been in, involved or has some understanding of perhaps what went wrong in those individual circumstances um, perhaps takes away from the value and sincerity of that apology. Okay. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kadena. Can I um, turn to the submission that uh, Mr Walsh, Peter Walsh put in uh, uh, for his organisation action against medical accidents. Basically, you say in your submission you work closely with ministers in England in regards to their duty of candour in their bill. And you then go on and say that we believe that if this is introduced in the right way, the duty of candour will represent the biggest breakthrough in patient safety and patient rights in Scotland's history and uh, place Scotland amongst uh, the, the basically the best in the world. Uh, but you do have major concerns about how the bill is currently being drafted. You then go on and don't pull any punches uh, in regards to Clause 21 and suggest that suggested amendments, uh, and you basically want to change wording and add definition. Uh, can I ask you, and also the other witnesses, um, what would you, whilst it's quite early, what you would suggest be changed what steps are you taking to, as you say, you were working closely with uh, ministers in England, what steps are you taking to work closely with ministers in Scotland in order to ensure that we do get this right and do get uh, the points that uh, Dennis Robertson and other people have said earlier uh, in order to ensure that we, we do get the best in the world? And can I ask the other witnesses, what steps are they taking in order to discuss with the government or other people in order to get this right. But Mr Walsh, I'd be very interested. Your report was very good, didn't pull any punches. So what you suggest that we do in order to ensure we get this the best in the world? Thank you. Um, I, I'm glad to say that um, we, we've had a, a, a very positive uh, relationship with um, uh, ministers and officials from the Scottish Government. I've already held one meeting with officials who are working on this. And I was very reassured to hear that the policy intention uh, behind the legislation 
uh, sits very neatly with what we're asking for in our submission. So it's, 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 it's perfectly possible to amend the, uh, the legislation and, of course, to frame the eventual regulations and the guidance in such a way as that they underline these points. The, those key points for us are at being absolutely clear about this uh, issue of uh, potential harm um, and well, potential harm, I, harm that might arise in the future being included. Um, it shouldn't be the case that the NHS or nursing home conducts its own investigation and only at the result of a rigorous investigation where it has been found conclusively that harm was caused or there was an unintended um, uh, harmful incident that you speak to the patient or their family. They should be involved at the very first stage that you suspect that may have happened um, so that they could be involved if they want to be in the investigation. Um, to, to, and so many investigations we see uh, have been conducted without any input from the family and then when they see the investigation report they say well if you'd only have asked me um, I could have told you it didn't happen that way and it's all got to start again so that's really really fundamental um, the other thing is the training and the support um, that has to be there right from the very beginning uh, I think we all we all agree about that we've mentioned that there has you know, this is mostly about underpinning culture change and supporting uh, the service and staff in doing the right thing. However, there, there needs to be a stick at the end of it, otherwise what's the point of it being in legislation? So being clear about that. There's a point about this definition, definition of incidents. Um, very important that, and I understand this is the policy intention, that omissions um, are included in that. So a failure to diagnose um, a delayed diagnosis that is subsequently recognized, that's an incident. Uh, it doesn't have to be a physical uh, slip of a scalpel or something that you can physically see and define. It's something that's gone wrong in someone's care that has the potential to result in harm. I have to say, I, I agree with this point about apologies uh, personally. Uh, of course, when carrying out the tutor counter procedure, we all would want and expect there to be an apology. But we have a difficulty conceptually about requiring an apology. So uh, if, if the family or the patient feels that the only reason they're getting something with the word I apologize in it is because they have to, because it's been said in statute, there's a danger that that will actually be diluted. Um, we think that good practice is best dealt with in, in the guidance. So there's lots of good things that could be said in the guidance about how to deliver information and how to make a meaningful apology. To my mind, an expression of sorrow or regret isn't a meaningful apology. That's just human regret that something has happened. You know, if that something should have been avoided, you want people to take some responsibility for that as well. Totally agree with uh, Christine's point about support. Uh, this is a very, very difficult time for people. It's the kind of uh, specialist support that both the uh, patient advice and support service um, and specialist charities like our own uh, are, are very well equipped uh, to, to help with. Um, there's one uh, potential gap uh, in the legislation we pointed out to officials, which I think they're minded to have a good look at, and that's what happens if the treatment where there was an unintended harmful incident um, comes to your attention, but you're not the provider of that treatment. So quite often a, a GP will see uh, or surmise that something went wrong in hospital treatment or, or vice versa. <coughs> now, I'm not saying it's, it, it's exactly the right way to do it, but this problem was recognized with the English version and they've made it a requirement that if something comes to light about the treatment provided in another provider uh, to your patient, even though you didn't provide that treatment, you can't just say, well, oh, it's nothing to do with me, keep my lips sealed. You need to actually go back to that original provider and say, do you know what? I think you need to uh, be having discussion with my patient about X, Y, and Z. And then that, that duty carries on. I think that would be uh, a nice way to, to close that gap in, in the legislation. Um, 
I think, I, th I think that's answered your question. So we hope and expect that our constructive dialogue with officials will continue, and they've indicated that they'd like us to be involved in discussing the regulations and the guidance when that comes about, and hopefully the training as well to get across to people that this isn't something they should be frightened of. They should welcome it, but they need the, the understanding uh, and the, um, the skills to do it well. Any other panel member, Do Dr. Henry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I mean, <clears throat> we are talking about engagement. We um, had a very helpful meeting with the Scottish Government Group under Professor White, who are looking at drafting guidance to discuss our concerns. And as I say, initially we were, you know, making the points we made earlier, but um, feeling that if the legislation is going ahead, it's very important that we get the guidance right. <clears throat> and off the back of that, uh, I've been asked personally to join the Professor White's group to help look at uh, some of the drafting of the guidance. Two big areas, I think, clearly around definitions and the other issue is around monitoring. Uh, and I won't go into huge details because we have, but a lot of it are, is around uh, when would the duty be triggered, what would the event be that results in harm, particularly if we were to go as far as looking at omissions. And I say this probably more <clears throat> in my experience having been a GP in Dundee for 10 years, the nature of practice is that you won't necessarily get everything right first time. And indeed, if every patient I saw that potentially had a serious diagnosis, you immediately referred for investigation or treatment, you'd over, you would grossly over-investigate, you would grossly, well, you would bring the secondary care system to, to its knees. So the question would be, if I've seen a patient two or three times with some vague symptomatology and it turns out that they did have a more serious illness, that would I have got it perhaps a week or two before? It may make no difference to the outcome, but is that... Now, I would hope, in fact, not, not only hope, the way I would have... The way I practised medicine was I would have had the conversation with the patient and said, look, you know, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be trying to c cover it up. But if I then had a statutory duty, do I need to get an independent doctor to critique my care, to feedback... Now, I mean, that certainly from a GP perspective, I, I would suggest would be unnecessarily burdensome or it would be unworkably burdensome. And I don't think it's really trying to do what it's all about because the nature of your relationship, hopefully with your, your GP, it, it wouldn't be based on that sort of thing. But you could see that for practices, uh, if they didn't have adequate training support and clarity in the definitions of at what point should something be triggered off, so there's that, again, some of the suggested disclosable events uh, in a hospital, I don't want, to, don't want to go through them in detail, but things like, which you can see at one level makes sense of things that we're talking about, patients having to be transferred to intensive care unexpectedly, or returning to theatre or being readmitted to hospital. Yes, I can see where it's coming from, but what you wouldn't want is that if a situation were to deteriorate that in a clinician's mind was, well, we better not send them to ICU because that would be a disclosable event or things like that. So it's trying to be quite clear what the threshold of harm is, what is the threshold of the event, and when we're getting somebody independent to look at it or critique it, I, I, it, I would suggest it has to be of a certain level of gravity. And I think to take Mr Walsh's point, involving the family and involving external or people who have not been involved, absolutely for very serious events. But I think it would be quite impossible for every single thing. And we know that something like 10 or 15% of clinical events, there is a problem. Uh, most don't result in harm. It's very difficult to produce, very difficult to predict future harm. Um, so I, again, I think if we, we're very keen to engage with Scottish Government to make sure that any guidance that comes out is practicable and actually supports the profession of being able to deliver good care. Anyone else? Christine I would just say we would want the whatever process to introduce to be as simple as possible for the members of the public raising concerns or being made aware of this, rather than just focusing on the impact this has on the health professionals. If somebody wants is unhappy or is made aware of this, they want that to be as simple and straightforward a process as possible. Can I, can I concentrate just for a minute on a point? Uh, Dr. Robert Henry made earlier about trust.
for doctors. Mm -hmm. I, 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 tr I trust my doctor implicitly. And most of the po population do. And, and I take the point that you're not psychic when I walk in with something you, you have to do tests, etc. But one of the comments that was made, and, and Bob Doris uh, made a, a statement on it earlier, Haemophilia Scotland, the Scottish Inf uh, Infected Blood Forum, one lady said that for 12 years she hadn't been told. Um, my view is that a doctor should be honest, forthright, and tell patients exactly. I know there are some patients who oh, I don't want you to tell me, you know, don't tell me about that, you know. Do you honestly agree with me that doctors should be, in, in the high regard we have for doctors, that doctors should be honest, forthright and, and upfront at all times with their patients? Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I have to say, as a GP, if I'd been sitting on a piece of information that one of my patients had contracted hepatitis or something like that, and I didn't tell them, I would expect to be... Uh, taken to task, I'd expect to be sent to the GMC. Frankly, I think that's. I mean, I don't. I don't know obviously all the stories, and but that is so far from what one could expect as reasonable uh, conduct. I mean, I think the whole clinical relationship and the way medicine's moving is about shared decision making. It's about because if there's no trust, frankly, the whole point of the exercise is lost, uh, and it's how we support and build that. It's easier in general practice. It's certain or it certainly used to be, uh, and I think, you know, we, sadly one of the problems we see in primary care is that's perhaps not, not what it was, uh, perhaps in, in, in my day. That's probably a, another issue for another day, but the, the whole relationship for it to work, indeed for the patients to get the best care, has to be based on trust and respect, mutual respect, and uh, all certainly what we're trying to do is to make sure we support that as far as possible, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's a long way of saying I agree with you. Thank you, Kinnear. Uh Colin Kerr, do you don't want to... So I think my question is answered a couple okay, of times. Okay, Colin. Annette Millen. Give me now my apologies for being late, arriving late this morning. Um, I was wondering at this point in time if it would be appropriate to ask the panel how this ties in with the the Apologies Scotland Bill, which is currently being looked at um, by Parliament and Margaret Mitchell's Bill. Um, which is going through Parliament just now. Um, should this, the duty of candour, be actually part of broader apologies legislation and therefore be taken out of this particular bill? Or do you think that Margaret Mitchell's apologies bill should be amended to exclude health and social care and left to this, this committee to pursue? My, my understanding is um, that Ms Mitchell's bill is looking at apology in its broadest sense, so it will apply to um, across the board in all civil liabilities. Um, clearly, we, we only focus on the apology in relation to, to health care and health and social care provision. And we have said something similar uh, in, in relation to what I said this morning, that again, the, the value of an apology and um, the Law Society has questioned whether or not, but only in a healthcare in, environment, whether Ms Mitchell's bill is, is required um, because we have a Compensation Act, we have NHS board guidance and policies and protocols, all of which are moving to change this, this culture that will allow an apology an explanation uh, and an action plan to be drawn up to try and ensure it won't it won't happen again. Anyone else? Um, for what it's worth, similar feelings about the apologies uh, bill. We're, we're not sure that it's actually needed because it, it is already accepted that an apology isn't an admission of liability, etc. Um, uh, as I said earlier, the other piece of legislation I think this could tie in with is the Patients' Rights Act, um, because we're really talking here about what in effect is a fundamental patient's rights that I think most people, most people on the street would expect already exists, but it doesn't until you pass this legislation. Um, and uh, I, I'm not suggesting you take it out of this uh, bill and wait to, to put it to, to change the Patients' Rights Act, but I think some kind of amendment to, to, to make this sit 
in the Patients' Rights Act, uh, as well as passing this legislation as quickly as possible, might be uh, uh, a more appropriate way of proceeding. No other comment from our witness panel? Christine Lyon. That would be more the, um, around the terminology, because the Patient Rights Act refers specifically to patients, and I don't know when it's social care whether people would define themselves as a patient. There would probably be a service user or other words, so you'd have issue around terminology if you were going to do that. Yes, just, just briefly, that patients' rights is looking at the right of the patient as an individual. The aim of the legislation before us today is to look at a duty of candour that applies to organisations. don't think they should be complacent. Thanks, Convener. I hope it was helpful to get that on the record. OK. Uh, do I have any other questions for committee member? Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Convener. If I was a health economist and I was to put my, that hat on, it would seem to me that if we introduce this, it will consume a certain amount of health resource in, in terms of compliance, training and so on and so forth. Is there a concern that that resource, given that we've got finite resources and you know, uh, budget, budget challenges, that that would take away from other aspects of health care and, and to what degree might that be a negative effect of this legislation? I can sorry, just make a brief yes. comment. I think you're right. I mean, the, I, I've seen the financial uh, assessment. Uh, I think if you were looking to support the change, I think it is useful to spend some of that money in education. Frankly, some of it might be better spent on Christine's colleagues and his advice to actually support patients, to help them get through uh, the process and have the dialogue um, uh, with with uh, uh, with the, the providers if something was to go wrong. So, I mean, I think if we were looking for a more joined up solution rather than adding necessarily a, a, an administrative burden, having some practical support for patients uh, when they've got queries or need support or need some understanding would be more, I think, appropriate way of spending money. Thank you. Professor Britton. Going back to section 21 and talking about involved persons, I think may impact upon resources. Um, imagine a scenario in, in, in a busy hospital. Um, one person may be treated by a whole chain um, of professionals um, from the moment they walk in the door and perhaps supervision might be given from a consultant who hasn't actually met the patient, dealt with them at all, but they would have the context to be able to, to comment on this. Um, would they be excluded from that? And if they were excluded, then resource implications, you would have to find somebody else who would have to come in and examine this, this whole situation and take the time um, that that would involve without having first-hand knowledge. Um, other examples would be perhaps a small GP practice. How would you get somebody uninvolved to know what consequences had actually occurred or perhaps single <coughs> care in a, in a social setting, perhaps caring for someone in their own home? to bring in somebody completely uninvolved is going to be challenging um, in, in many terms, not least resources, but they would need to be trained, they would need to understand, they would need to get that context. Um, so I, I believe when we're looking at these definitions, this idea of the extent of involvement could be perhaps usefully reviewed to make better use of the, the resources and, not, and expertise and knowledge of the person dealing with a particular case. Thank you. As far as I can see, there's, there's, there's two areas where there could be uh, resource implications. This, this uh, uh, latter one just mentioned about seeking an independent health professional's opinion. Uh, we raised that in our submission and we discussed it with colleagues. I understand that it's, it's not the, the actual intention that every incident that might be subject to the duty of candour uh, procedures is independently reviewed and the decision made by an independent uh, clinician. Uh, we certainly hope that's the case because that would be burdensome and unnecessary. It would cost money, uh, but also, more importantly, it would delay health professionals getting on with what most of them already do, uh, the right thing in explaining to their patients. Um, so you don't want to get in the way of that. But if there's, if there's any doubt, then of course taking it to an independent person for a second opinion is a good idea. That would be a very modest resource implication. The other resource implication, uh, I think, is uh, with the training and support. 
particularly initially, really getting this off on the right foot with widespread awareness in a way that sadly didn't happen from day one uh, in England, and, and a certain amount of ongoing training and support. But having said that, whilst there are some resource implications, one has to remember this is fundamental stuff that really people should be doing already. And if they're not doing it, we need to invest in it, uh, or they may need to invest in it. Um, the other thing to say is that it's so fundamental to patient safety uh, that if this contributes to improvements in patient safety, the savings from it will far, far um, outweigh uh, the, the modest resource that's put into it. Just a bit further then about the savings. The savings would come uh, as part of uh, improving patient safety. So we're talking about incidents here, which if a health board is prepared, for example, to sweep under the carpet and not, not tell the patient, not tell the family, it's very unlikely that they're actually going to be learning about that incident internally to help prevent it happening to someone else. So if this contributes towards changing that culture to, to getting a genuine learning culture and learning from each and every incident, um, then preventing the extra bed days, the extra treatment, um, the extra litigation by prevention in the future uh, is where the payback comes, as well, of course, as this is something you know, we'd aspire to as a basic function, a basic right, a basic ethical practice uh, in any case. Yeah, no, I'm, any I'm other, Mike, any other responses to the yeah. original question? Christine, let me know. I was nervous with that. Convener, if there was any, had there been any, has there been any analysis that attempts to quantify that effect, the lessening of failure demand, if you like, that you, that you just touched on? Uh, there hasn't been any yet in relation specifically to duty of candour, of course, because it's, it's so new. Uh, in terms of patient safety, there's um, a, a massive literature and research around the, the positive savings long term that can be, and in some instances have been, uh, actually made through improving patient safety. Duty of candour is part of that. It's not, you know, it's not all of it. Thank you. Bob Doris, I think it's his last question. Yeah, and you believe it's not—it's not actually a question. But it's, it's to reflect uh, some of the, the information we got again from the Scottish Infected Blood Forum, Haemophilia Scotland, and the Hep C Trust. I didn't want to intervene during the discussion and questions in relation to receiving a, a meaningful apology, but it would be reasonable, given that they will be following this evidence session, to put on record that in relation to infected blood, they were pretty clear that whilst they really, really appreciate. Apologies coming from the likes of the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing. It was much more meaningful when the Blood Transfusion Service said something. And I think that's important to put on record. They felt getting, yes, getting the corporate apology at the top is meaningful in terms of systems changes and learning as a, as a, as a system. And I think Unison said something about that last week in their evidence. But for the people affected, getting that apology as close to where the incident took place is far more meaningful for them and that was some of the information that we got so there's not a question in that it's just that i think they would like that reflected uh, on on the official uh, record here today given that that was one of the discussions convener okay that concludes th th this session can i thank you on behalf of the committee for uh, your attendance here your written evidence and the contribution to our inquiry thank you all very much indeed thank you, thank you. we're going to suspend at this point and set up the next panel
uh, agenda item number three, uh, which is our first evidence session uh, on palliative, uh, palliative uh, care inquiries. Um, before uh, before um, we, we we move into taking evidence, I, I, would, I would like to put on record uh, our, our thanks for um, to the staff and service users at uh, Rachel House in Kinross uh, and uh, at Gown Hospice in, in Greenock for hosting members uh, of the committee um, th this week. Uh, I know and uh, accompanied me. Others yesterday that we found our visit to our Gown Hospice extremely helpful um, and, and useful. Mm -hmm. and, and although Rhoda um, has, is not here today, that I've spoken to her, and she is, she was reflecting the same sort of thoughts on on her her, her visit to Rachel House. So thank her thanks to everybody who made that that possible and and, and made this inquiry all the more meaningful for that engagement. We welcome with us today Amy Dalrymple, Head of Policy, Alzheimer's Scotland, Tricia Hart, um, Senior Macmillan Development Manager uh, here in Scotland, uh, welcome, uh, Richard Mead, Head of Policy, Public Affairs, uh, Marie Curie, uh, and Maria McGill, Chief Executive of Children's Hospice Association Scotland, welcome to you all. Uh, in the interest of time, and we don't expect any opening statements, we're moving very quickly to our first, first, first question, which is from Malcolm Chisholm. Well, thank you all for very detailed um, written submissions, so they were all extremely useful. If I could just focus on a couple of points uh, in Macmillan, which may um, introduce uh, some, some issues. Uh, you say there's a growing misperception that palliative and end-of-life care is a generic speciality which can be universally applied all, across all conditions. And then by, you give an example, we know cancer creates a unique set of challenges. And then you also highlight what you regard as another misperception that all cancer patients receive good palliative and end-of-life care. And you state that between one quarter and one third of cancer patients had not been identified as having palliative care needs. So I, I think obviously there's a, a, a legitimate emphasis in all the submissions that we have to s extend palliative and end of life care to uh, many conditions, not just cancer. But but I wonder, uh, and also I think there's an emphasis in, in, in many of the submissions that there is a role for generalists in relation to palliative care. But I suppose I would just like to explore what potentially could be the tension between those things, but I'm sure in fact probably is, is, is not really a tension because they, they cover um, the totality of, of the issue. But, but if, if, if we could explore those, start with that, that would be helpful, I think, for the committee. Okay, um, absolutely. We are here to support um, palliative care for all, need not diagnosis. Um, within cancer services, there has been um, a lot of emphasis on delivering palliative and end-of-life care. However, as you know, with the growing increase in patients with a diagnosis of cancer, living longer, um, and sometimes um, we know through speaking to patients and the family members that they absolutely don't always get the care that they need, particularly during that palliative and end-of-life um, phase. So I think that we um, from Macmillan would like to welcome that we have got lots of experience. What we'd like to extend and support um, palliative care right across all diagnosis. And I think we are in a unique position that we have had um, a lot of focus around palliative and end of life care. Um, we've got um, a lot of skills within the clinical nurse specialists. Um, we support the upskilling of generalist staff. There's a lot, a number of patients out there who receive palliative and end-life care from a cancer diagnosis that receive care from generalist staff um, right across the piece. So that could be in their own homes, it could be in the hospital sit situation, um, and it could be in care homes or wherever that person um, is needing care. Would the others like to comment? Richard, would you like to comment? On? I would just say, um, just in terms of um, your know, sort of first point about uh, being um, a generic uh, form of care, I think palliative care is probably the in one of the truest forms, person-centred care, and I think that's what's really important to emphasise is that palliative care can be very different 
um, to different people and it should always be uh, the patients and their families' needs put at the centre of that care. And of course, it's holistic care as well. So it's not just medical interventions. It's not just pain and symptom management. It's often about emotional, spiritual, psychological support, as well as planning uh, in terms of what people would like to see, what matters to them in the time that they have. So I think um, it's really important to emphasise that palliative care is truly person-centred care and can be very different depending on um, the different patients and families that receive it. Uh, convener and first of all I'd like to thank the committee for uh, enabling the voice of children and families to be brought to this inquiry. Um, children and young people's palliative care is perhaps a little different uh, in several ways and one of those ways in, is indeed the range of conditions uh, that we in children's palliative care see over 400 conditions and very few children and young people with cancer and in fact 2009 uh, the latest numbers I have of the 450 children who died only 36 of those had cancer so the, it's a, a, a different uh, situation that we in children's palliative care meet having said that it's really important that every one of those children and young people who have have um, a short, a life shortening condition, receive the quality of life, uh, uh, the best possible quality of care possible wherever they are and whenever they need it across Scotland. <coughs> I think our point would actually support what Macmillan are trying to say. Our, our view is very much that the literature around palliative care and the experience of around palliative care does. Um, there tends to be more around cancer than other conditions. And so the research around dementia and palliative care is actually still developing and relatively early on. So we would, we would suggest that palliative care is not generic in itself. And you, you, you need the two spe specialisms, a, a kind of a condition specialism um, and the palliative specialism to come together and to be and to be working together in order to have the person-centred care that Rich is describing. The four of us, I think, are probably agreeing, but would, exp but would just come to it from very different places. Thanks for that, Mum. I'm happy with that at the moment. Thanks. Can I move on then to Dennis Robertson? Uh, thank you, Convener. I suppose one of the problems is that palliative care seems to mean different things to different people. Uh, and even within the medical profession, and we were hearing yesterday uh, from a, a specialist nurse in palliative care that even you know junior doctors, when you talk palliative, they sometimes think it's end of life. Um, and the, the perception, perhaps, in the wider community is when we talk about people requiring palliative care, again, for many, it's towards end of life, rather than this holistic aspect that Richard is talking about. Uh, I'm just wondering... Is, is this part of a barrier that we need to actually get out a message, a clear message, that palliative care is, is this person-centred approach to the needs of the, the, the individual? And it's not necessarily on end of life. And uh, again, the, the aspect of it's not just for cancer patients. Amy? Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> Sorry, it would, I, it, would, it would be helpful if I was allowed to. I, I, let, I let Mal come away with you. See how quickly they take advantage, <laughs> don't you? I apologise. Start calling their own answers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I'll, 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 I shall prevail. Amy. Thank you, Duncan. <laughs> um, I mean, now, now I've lost where I was. I, I, no, I would, I would certainly agree. For, for us, we're looking at um, the development of what you call an extended palliative phase with dementia. Prognosis is really difficult with dementia and identifying end of life in dementia is very difficult, particularly when somebody is dying of dementia rather than just with dementia. So you might die with dementia in that you're dying of something else, but dementia is impacting on your experience there or of dementia. If you're dying of dementia, ex identifying that end of life phase is very, very hard. So we'd encourage a palliative approach really um, a lot earlier on. Um, and the, la the language around that is something that sometimes um, that, that we need to work out how we approach that with families and with people themselves because of this conflation between palliative care and end of life care. And I think, again, that comes from where the palliative care approach comes from um, in terms of it being developed um, 
developed with you know kind of with specific conditions in mind and now we're trying to broaden that approach out to other conditions and we need to look at how we adapt it and how we therefore adapt the conversations around it as well in order to um, enable families and people um, people with conditions to be comfortable with it um, and to and, and to accept that and to mean that and therefore to enable them to access it and access the benefits it might bring anyone else Richard. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, th I think it's uh, there's a couple of points that I'd like to pick up on. Um, and the first one is, I mean, uh, there is a comparable uh, symptom burden in all types of terminal illness that palliative care can support. And palliative care should be introduced from the point of need. And that can be very different depending on the person or their condition or, or conditions. So it could be years, it could be months, it could be weeks, it could be days. And I think that's really important. And in terms of um, what you were talking about in terms of barriers, we need to make sure that there are um, there is enough training and education for not just um, specialists in palliative care, but also generalists, and that's GPs, that's district nurses, that's um, consultants in hospitals, different specialisms as well, to make sure that they understand that and how to link in with palliative care when the time is right for that particular patient. Sometimes it's just the start of a conversation, and actually when somebody is uh, seriously ill, um, there is a point in which somebody approaches them and talks to them about that condition and talks to them about what, their, um, what matters to them in, in, the, in the potentially short time they have left and then to plan for that. And that's something I think we need to look at in terms of training and education as well. But it's part of, a, I think, um, a bit of a wider issue around ha having open and honest conversations. And that's not just a, um, an issue for our healthcare and social care professionals, but actually it's a societal issue. We need to have more open and honest conversations about uh, the end of life, about being terminally ill, and what that might involve, and how we can approach that. Maria, and then Trisha. Thank you. Um, I would wholeheartedly agree with uh, Richard that this is a societal issue. Uh, open and honest conversations are incredibly important for everyone, and when, particularly when I'm thinking of, of the children and families that I'm representing. Uh, for children, the, the time span of their condition may extend into to years. So palliative care for children uh, is often around for years and should be involved at the point of need. One of the barriers is that perhaps the, the benefits and impacts uh, and positive uh, impacts that palliative care can bring to a child with a life-shortening condition aren't perhaps as well known as they might be to families and particularly to professionals on whom we rely for referrals. So I think it's you know, we have a multitude of barriers, one being uh, the willingness of all of us in society to have open conversations about what we would wish uh, in terms of our place of care and place of death, but also about, particularly for children, the benefits of uh, early referral to palliative care. Just to add again and agree with um, what everyone's saying here, just around the palliative care um, agenda and issue for people and this is about everyone's business it's not just about the clinicians it's not just about the social care staff it's about the people the public themselves as well and being able to to find it in themselves to understand at what stage does their needs become palliative um, and using things like holistic needs assessment which actually goes across looks at um, a person-centered approach and really identifies for that person what the real needs are for that person um, and that often can be some things that it could be housing, it could be something else that is sometimes not of, always key to their actual diagnosis. Um, so it's about really identifying these needs, um, whether that be, I mean, palliative care could start very early after diagnosis. And again, as Richard said, that's different for, for everyone, every person. Did you want to, I, just I just wanted to add something as well, is that um, people's palliative care needs can change throughout their um, condition as well. So they may end up needing some quite intense support at the start. They may have a, then a period of sort of um, needing less services. So it can sort of come in and out. It doesn't have to be just once you get palliative care, you get a certain level right through. It can change as well. Dennis, do you? Thank you, convener. I was waiting to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Are you going uh, to continue to waste time? Precious time that we have. Tricia, uh, I wonder just be, it's everyone's business. Uh, Professor Clark has stated that as well. He also said that you know Scotland's providing some of the best palliative care in the world, but he recognises there's still a lot to be done. Uh, in recognition of that, and taking up uh, Richard Mead's point, that, that, that things change. 
whose business is it really to identify when a person requires palliative care in that journey, in that pathway? Because they could, they could be having care at the moment from someone else, say social care, for instance. Um, and then it's what is the trigger to palliative care and, and who identifies it and what steps do we need to ensure that people get the, the care that they require at the time of need? And I think, again, that goes back to looking at who upskilling general staff so that people right across the piece have got skills to be able to recognise when that person's needs change. Um, an example of that would be looking at the Improving Cancer Journey that um, we're supporting through Glasgow City Council and NHS GGNC, just again identifying that person's needs at that particular time and either signposting them or directing them back to whether it's a clinician, whether it's a specialist, whether it's the GP, whether it's a district nurse, or whether it's social care. So who's the relevant person to support that person at that particular time? So it goes back to, again, making sure that staff right across the piece um, are skilled to be able to recognise, um, whether that's through conversation, whether it's through sitting down, um, supporting someone with a holistic needs assessment, looking at kind of anticipated care planning. So all these things getting taken into consideration to help identify. Um, so I think it is everyone's business. Um, it was just interesting what, what the distinction Dennis made between um, social care and, and palliative care. I'd say that there's a full range of professionals involved in delivering palliative care at the moment who don't necessarily recognise that they're doing that, um, but they are delivering palliative care. There's an argument to be made for, for dementia that all the care delivered there is palliative because it's not curative. Um, in that, you know, kind of in that, that very stark definition of what palli you, you might make of palliative care. In terms of the trigger for when palliative care specialist services might need to be brought in either to provide care or, to, or preferably for us to support those professionals already providing care to continue to do so because that continuation of personnel is very important for people with dementia and other cognitive difficulties. Um, we'd say that that needs to be done in a multidisciplinary way by that whole team um, who are in an ideal world working in a coordinated way to provide the the health and social care supports for a person with dementia um, that are all interacting with each other and helping that person have the best quality of life. And when palliative care specialism is identified as being necessary to, to support that delivery and to maintain that quality of life, then it needs to be brought in. But it needs to be done in a team way. It needs to involve the person where possible and it needs to involve um, the, those closest to them as well. Richard, Maria. Um, I was just going to say that um, it is everyone's um, business um, and there are a range of screening tools out there to help and support professionals in identifying people um, and triggers for palliative care. And I think it goes back again to the education and training and making sure that when we have good and useful tools that they are supported and, um, and, and widely used and that um, health and social care professionals have the training and support to, to use them. I do. Thank you very yeah, much. <laughs> um, Dennis, you were asking about uh, triggers uh, and uh, identification. I think for uh, children's palliative care, it's really important that all health and social care professionals have an awareness of uh, what palliative care can bring. That referral to a palliative care service for a child with a life-shortening condition does not mean the end of curative treatment. It simply means that that child and family have access to uh, a life-enriching uh, experience and to professionals who are perhaps better able to manage symptom management uh, and who can who have time and the ability to sit down with families and understand what matters most to them and to work with the entire team around the child and to help make that happen. So there is something about an awareness for everyone. In terms of the, the, the tools and identification, uh, there are some for adults for sure, but in children's palliative care, less so. It's a, it's a newer um, specialty within palliative care. So we have some research to do uh, to get those right. Thanks. Thanks for that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, just to add, um, again, one of the triggers is around even the carers. So just identifying, so if carers are recurring, that just identifying their needs as well. Um, and it could be a, a frequenting into, see, one of our information support services, into GP service. And, and that's where the trigger comes. It's they're not coping. And that's when it's identified that um, the person they are caring for has got um, other needs. 
Bob, did you? Yeah, um, thanks, I appreciate that. Convener, I'm very interested in what Amy Dorimple was saying about uh, social care and where it naturally develops into palliative care. Uh, and I think a lot of it goes unrecognised and as part of good quality social care. And I understand whether specialist palliative care uh, being provided and other witnesses can give quite powerful examples of that. There's this perception that it kicks in at some point. But I think a few of us will have personal experience with our families, but it's not a case of something kicking in. It's a general deterioration, and particularly with dementia, over a period of time, which comes with getting old and frail as well, but also significant uh, issues with, with dementia. And whether that's in a generalist social care sector or a specialist unit, and it's about how we map some of the good quality palliative care that exists out there, uh, for example, vascular dementia, uh, where, where people unlearn things, basic things such as being able to swallow and eat and chew um, and communicate, and how we map the good practice that's taking place there and how we support as appropriate, because I suspect there's a significant amount, and I'm, I'm drawing from personal experience, a significant amount of um, people in the, if you like, general social care residential sector who have additional palliative needs and it's a mixed bag as to how they've been provided. And I'm not sure that local authority and third sector organisations are able to maybe uh, develop a system where you can identify where additional care resources are needed or to draw in other agencies to support that. So how do we map some of that out? And I'm aware I'm talking specifically about uh, you know dementia. Um, but how do we start to map some of that out and quantify it? Because I suspect there's been an unmet need for generations in the residential care sector, and it's okay to admit there's a gap there and work towards trying to address some of that. So how do we map some of that out in terms of providing the evidence and then the, the, the method by which to deliver and improve the quality of care for people in those situations? I'm going to have to try very hard to be brief with this, but we can have a full other meeting about this ourselves if you're if you're interested in that. Um, I'm happy to do that um, because this is something we've been looking at in a lot of detail, and um, we'll have a, a full report on how these we we envisage this being provided and how we think it should be provided, published towards the end of October, um, which um, I will of course send to members of the committee. Um, but briefly, there, in terms of residential care, there is an underdiagnosis of, uh, of dementia in residential care. So there are people with dementia in residential care who we don't know have dementia. Um, and that means that they're not necessarily getting their needs met. You've also got an issue with, you've got pockets, as you say, of really good practice, whereby you've got a hospice joining up with a care home and their sharing skills, or you've got really good relationships between, say, a community hospital and a care home. Um, and they're, you know, kind of sharing skills there because it's about bringing the health element into it as well. So, for example, those swallowing problems you're talking about, that needs a speech and language therapist. And that is not necessarily going to sit with the local authority. That's about sitting with the, with the health board there as well. So we're hoping that the integration of health and social care and the, the integration of those budgets um, should lead to more coordinated support there. But it is really crucial. Um, and I'll, you know, kind of tribute to the independent care sector. They're recognising this and kind of starting to do their bit in terms of trying to um, make links with the new health and social care partnerships. But it is crucial that that partnership exists with the third sector and the independent sector as well to make sure that there's that coordination. It's why we suggest that somebody with dementia requires a role of a dementia practice coordinator to coordinate all those all those parts of care that are needed to make sure that somebody um, that somebody is supported in the way that they best can be and also so that those care staff who you're talking about in a care you know kind of in a residential care home aren't being asked to do um, a very complex care support job, unsupported and untrained. They need access to training and they need access to specialist support to enable them to provide the care that they're expected to. Thank Anyone you. else? Wish to respond to that? No. Um, convener, okay, just, I, I just want... Uh, uh, Ms. Sorry, sorry, Convener, it's, it's your job. Uh, Ms. Hatt, I just wanted to kind of wonder if other witnesses would agree that we have to get better. Sometimes we quantify when 
something major happens or there's a diagnosis or there's a significant downturn in people's health and that's when palliative care kicks in and that's when we start to count it. We do the bean counting of palliative care, if you like, um, and we have to get better of realising that palliative care builds up gradually over time and we have to get better at quantifying that. I won't come back in after that, but I think that, that, that's a kind you, of more you've general point that I was trying to make. some response anyway. We'll see if you, <laughs> when you get the response, whether you want back in or not, but we'll see. Maria, Patricia <laughs> and <do>. Richard. <laughs> Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, I would agree with what you're saying, that sometimes palliative care is prompted by a significant event or a diagnosis. In terms of uh, pr the provision of palliative care for children, we recognise because... It can, be, it can extend over a, quite a significant period of time that palliative care is there from the beginning. And so for children, for example, there may be a series of short plan breaks in our hospices that enable families to continue to care in the community where they want to be and then sub being supported by that package of care round about them and also by CHAS at home, having access to specialist expertise as and when they need it. And so sometimes those short plan breaks over a number of years are what's is simply what's enough for families. They are described as a lifeline for families that enable them to go back home. And then as things change, as they often do, uh, then we're able to uh, hopefully seamlessly come in and support the family with some specialist support and indeed support that team around that child, which is in an incredibly important part of the work. So thank you. I think just to add to that again, again around that transitions of care and um, looking at risks for people where we've got lots of experience amongst all of us, amongst the clinicians, social care staff. So we, we, there is an area that we do know, or re relatively know that someone at some stage will require palliative care. So it's about identifying that very, very early on. And again, using the tools that we spoke about um, to support that and making sure that things are actually in place before we get to those crucial points before we get to people having to be admitted. Um, their choice of place of death is not um, adhered to because things have just fallen through. Um, uh, and it's about having sort of single point of access so that people, particularly in residential care, care homes, um, have got access to, to, to that kind of breadth of care um, and support that's out there to support them in their own home. Yeah, I mean, I think we'd all agree that there is um, great examples of, of care being taken, taking place in social care settings and in primary care with GPs and district nursing without the need to refer to specialist palliative care. Um, but I think it highlights a sort of a bigger issue is that we just don't have the data and the information um, and to understand what the true picture is out there. To give an example, I mean, there, uh, there is... I think 12, 000, just short of 12,000 people on the palliative care register, yet 40,000 uh, people are estimated to need palliative care um, that die each year. So where are the rest? And how do we understand what that, that number truly looks like? Um, I think a big part of the issue is, is identification and doing more to identify people that have palliative needs and in whatever setting that they are, that they are in. And that will help us understand where the examples of good practice are, where there, are um, uh, where there is unmet need and what we potentially could do to meet that need and improve care. Some of the discussions we had yesterday, just going back to those triggers and how people are referred, um, you know, the, the, we had a discussion in Greenock yesterday where people referred themselves, it was word of mouth, and it was not to access palliative care, it was the, well, I suppose in this broadest sense, it was the access transport and support to get for, for chemo or radium in, in Glasgow. So the transport service, they availed themselves of other services. Uh, they are going along, but it was difficult to get them to confirm who referred them there or what is it worth them out. So even with those who are accessing, and the, the, you know the, the 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 other thing that came up, I think, is people will seek that palliative care because they've got knowledge and association, uh, and we know it's 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 more accessible when you've got a cancer. But to have that difficult discussion about the curative palliative situation and COPD or heart disease. There is no, you know, that people believe in some cases if they're moving on to palliative care, that's it. They have done all that they can for me. I've been sent home from the hospital. You've heard all of this. You know, so, you know, some, some of those people don't want to avail themselves of that because of, you know, the, the perception and culture. Uh, others don't know about it. 
um, uh, and others could benefit from it who are not benefiting. And you know, th I think that's the, the, the committee's job to try and pick their way through that. Um, Richard, yes, I mean, I think it's also it's important to highlight, I think sometimes access to palliative care can come very much down to who you see, which healthcare professional. And there are examples of great care provided by general practitioners who will, uh, and it's not just for specialists, but for generalists as well, uh, generalist care. And I think if you've got a GP that's prepared to have those open and honest conversations, sit down with the person, talk about what they might need, what's important to them, then they, they get good care. But that just isn't happening in every setting. And I think that is really important point is that sometimes it can come down to who you see as to what level of care you get and what access to what care you get. Tosha and Maria? I think Duncan just you'd ex you'd, you'd expressed an opinion there around that um, everyone with a cancer diagnosis gets access to the part of care, um, and we know that again, as I said in the opening statement, um, these numbers are increasing. People are living, thankfully, longer due to really good um, research, good treatments. But some people are living longer with difficult problems um, and with increasing palliative care needs. Um, so I think just to make that point, and secondly, just around, um, there is good models of care out, up, out there about joined up care. And as, as I'd explained earlier around the improving cancer journey, it's one example, it's been driven forward by social care. And that's about identifying people when they're diagnosed. So that's when people really start to, um, then you can start to do that holistic needs assessment. The clinicians, the patients themselves say, generally they're very well cared for, they've got lots of care around about them. But often it's the other things outside, it's the housing, it's the spiritual, it's the family, it's the other things that are not always um, being addressed. And I think it's looking at good examples of models of care like that, which is something that we'd like to, to obviously extend. Sure, they're, they're, and uh, with a cancer, they're more likely to get palliative yeah, care. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we understand that yeah. and we recognise there's Absolutely. a need even in yes. that area. And I think that's a challenge about yeah. extending that principle right across the board Absolutely. and whether that's possible. Absolutely. Maria? Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points, just a reminder to the committee that the situation uh, with cancer is, is different in children's palliative care, so it's just, um, excuse me for reminding you. Uh, the other issue, I just wanted to build on the data that uh, Richard was talking about, and there is some good news around data uh, in that Chaz, uh, supported by Scottish Government, uh, has commissioned some research from the University of York, which is due to be published in November, which will tell us the number of children and young people in Scotland who have a life-shortening condition and where they are based by Health Board. It's a point-in-time exercise. It will be incredibly useful. At the moment, the, the numbers we have uh, tell us there are about 4,000 children and young people at any time. Chaz uh, saw 400 children last year. We think this research will tell us there are many thousands, so we have much work to do to make sure that every baby, child and young person can have access to palliative care they need when they need it. And also to bear in mind that actually it's about a choice. So for some families, uh, they may, that, that I know of, coming to a hospice isn't right for them. So our service works hard to be incredibly flexible. And so we can actually accept them into our care, making sure they have access, but support them in home. Uh, so that they still have, families still have some respite, uh, a child is able to have some, uh, have some outings and have some experiences they may not otherwise have. And all of that happening out with the hospices where the, and so it's about family choice, really ensuring our services uh, are child and family centred. Richard. Thank you, Convener. Firstly, can I put on record, and I'm sure every one of us want to put on record the excellent work with all of your organisations do, the help you do for people, real people out, uh, out in, uh, in Scotland. Um, I'll come to the point that uh, Richard Mead was on about and, and you were touching on the question I was going to um, go on about. And it's about data and co good quality data. And I'll refer to the Macmillan Cancer Support uh, Report, uh, our submission, which at first I had concern about, Tricia, but then I realised why you put it in. A recent English study found that half of the patients dying at home received no partial pain control. This must improve. But if you go down to the appendix, you find that this is the National Survey of Bereaved People Voices 2014. This data is not collected in Scotland. So that's the reason why, and I now know why you were, you were putting that in. There was a long bow in order to get someone like me to ask the question, why not? Yeah, and you put in the 
the fact that there are, um, uh, in your report, Trisha, you say 10,800. Richard, a wee while ago, said tw over 12,000. No one knows. Some people say 20,000. How many? How do we collect? You know, because as far as I'm concerned, if someone says I've got cancer, somebody will then put me up on a, a board and, and say, well, you, you have to be seen by so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Um, so why is this data not being collected? Why do we not have the exact um, statistics that we do need in order to ensure that the, the great work that you guys are doing uh, is carried on and ensuring that the people in Scotland get the, the attention and the care that they deserve? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, to try and pick some of that, um, we don't know what the, the, the accurate picture is. Um, we've got best guesses and estimates, and uh, we can use things like the palliative care register as, a, as an indicator. Um, so I think we need to see much more movement in this uh, area. I know David Clark picked up that in his uh, evidence and in his uh, report to the committee. Um, identification, I think, is a big part of that, making sure that we pick people up that have palliative needs, uh, and uh, whether that's on the palliative care register or, or something else, we actually capture that. Uh, in terms of um, how we might achieve that, well, the Scottish Government um, has committed to producing a strategic framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care, uh, which will be published by the end of the year. Um, and I hope and, and I'm confident that data and capturing that information will be a big part of that framework. Uh, and I think that will be very helpful. In terms of the types of data that we're, we, we need to see, um, which brings me to sort of your point about voices, is yes, we need to see the, the, the quantitative data. We need to understand the numbers, the, 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 how many people need palliative care, when they get it, the kind of interventions they receive, and, 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 and the outcomes. But we also need to understand the quality of that care as well. So particularly um, when we're talking about uh, patients and, and their personal outcomes and, and what they want and what matters to them uh, in, in the time that they have, um, that we need um, to measure as well, which is where something like Voices, um, which asks um, bereaved carers uh, about the care that their loved ones received is so important. Uh, and to be fair, the Scottish Government, um, the Minister Jamie Hepburn, did uh, commit uh, in May to looking at introducing voices um, primarily, I think, at a local level uh, in Scotland. And, and we fully support that and, and we hope that the Scottish Government um, sort of develops that and takes it forward. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, if we can get a voices survey um, in Scotland that can develop a baseline of, of what quality palliative care looks like, and, and that would be really important as well as the quantitative. So again, just to answer the question, and absolutely, it just shows you that there's data, is, there's a number of different numbers um, going around. Um, I think the important thing is that we do, we, we all agree that we do need the baseline data to start us off. Um, GP and palliative care registers are there. It's We try to understand why some patients um, don't, they, they're not registered on the palliative care register. Is that because they're in a care home or, and this, the, 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 the staff feel that maybe they need to refer them into a specialist service in order to get them in registered on the palliative care register. So there's a number of things that I would agree with Richard that we do um, need to look at and having the support of the Scottish Government is, is fantastic to actually get us all together um, and actually get that information that's there. Maria? And just perhaps a, a, a reassurance that we will have the data for children uh, next month uh, and perhaps children and young people's palliative care is, is leading the way in that, that respect. We are delighted to uh, be able to uh, do this work with the University of York. It uh, will certainly allow us, as David Clark said last week, to begin to develop and test some models based on evidence uh, Given the financial circumstances, what is the best model of care that can be developed across Scotland to meet the needs of these children and young people? In terms of voices, I would absolutely uh, support its use. Uh, it's been around and used in England for more than 10 years, and Professor Addington Hall has done quite a remarkable job with that work. However, uh, my understanding is it's not used for uh, under-18s. So I think if we are going to use this in Scotland, we should uh, consider very clearly the further development of that work to ensure it captures every, every death. Yeah, just on the data point... Um, it's really, really hard 
to look at how many people with dementia require palliative care. And I'm talking about that, how many people whose dementia will impact on their experience of palliative care. So there will be other people with very mild dementia who, who it won't impact on their experience of it quite so much. Um, we There's probably about 46,000 people um, with the diagnosis of dementia. The trajectory of dementia is so variable that it's very hard to predict how many of them will be coming to the end of their life. But as I say, there are, depending on the type of dementia, you'd want to introduce elements of palliative care earlier on anyway, before end of life. Um, you've then got to look at where those people are, um, but it's going to have an impact on how that's delivered. Most people coming to the end of life with dementia are in a care home at the moment. Um, increasing numbers are living in their own homes and hospital is still a very significant place for where people are. Very, very few, even compared to the general population who are in hospices, are in hospices. Hospice, hospices are not generally accessed by people with dementia at the moment. They are a bit, but it is very, very few people. So it's really hard to... Um, it's really hard to, to work out how many people you're talking about with dementia at the moment. Um, there's some work, the Scottish Government are looking at incidents and when in people's lives incident people are getting their dementia, if you understand what I mean. It's increasingly, as, as older people get it, um, that will be nearer the end of their lives. So people will spend two or three years living with dementia rather than, um, you know, kind of between five and nine, which is the usual trajectory for Alzheimer's. Um, so I can't give you an answer, um, but there's a lot of work that's going on and needing to be done still, but we still need really, I think, um, an up-to-date um, prevalence study in Scotland, um, which we, we which we don't have at the moment. We use the European figures to give us the best um, the best outline that that we can at the moment, but it's 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 very difficult to pin down. And because it's underdiagnosed, um, it, that that's one of the reasons it's harder to pin down those figures. So we need to improve our diagnosis rates in order to be able to improve planning for this for palliative care. Thank you. Thank you. I've actually got the excellent answers that I wanted. Thank you. Annette. Thanks, Convener. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, respite care. I mean, um, Maria touched on it in terms of Chaz just briefly, but Maria, I know, is very familiar with Robert Watson and his What About Us campaign. And, I mean, he makes the point in his petition to the Parliament, as you probably know, um, really saying that the majority of adult hospices provide palliative care but no respite and he says you know the importance of respite cannot be underestimated and um, that the provision of adequate and appropriate respite care shouldn't be seen as an add-on to palliative care but should be an integral part of it i'd be interested in the panel's comments on that to, to start i'm sure other colleagues will, will want to to join in after me. Um, I'm incredibly proud of Robert Watson's achievements in terms of his um, petition and the uh, parliamentary debate and I was very proud of Parliament that night uh, when Robert's debate was, um, was, the, was uh, Robert's issue was debated. In terms of uh, respite, you're right that it's incredibly important um, certainly for children, for this particular group of young people. Um, and there are around 90 young people in CHAS over the age of 18 who will, over the, the coming years, uh, be transition likely to be transitioning into adult services. And for some, it's uh, about having a place to go for respite, so whether that's um, an adult hospice or another facility. And for some young people, uh, they want to um, embrace self-directed support and will use that uh, to have a different form of respite. So we have been working with every adult hospice in Scotland, bearing in mind that uh, respite for these young people is about a choice and where they would wish that uh, to be. And... So we're working with uh, Marie Curie in Glasgow. We've got some focus groups coming up with young people and their families to help us and to help Marie Curie uh, understand what it is that uh, could be provided for young people. And we're also working uh, with Lukey House down in North Berwick on a, a particular uh, test of a, a breakdown there with our 
staff, working with Lukey House staff, with that group of young people to see if that's a, a possible model. So there's a, a variety of ways in which we are uh, seeking to find respite for this group of young people, some of whom are supported by CHAS, but of course this is a, an increasing number of young people uh, in our, living in our communities with life-shortening conditions. When they were diagnosed, it was thought that they were likely to die before they reached adulthood, but actually with medical advances, young people are living very much longer uh, and the numbers are increasing, uh, if we look at the numbers in England, increasing from, uh, I think, 19 per 10,000 up to uh, now 35 per 10,000 populations. So it's perhaps a, a, a significant and uh, hidden need at the moment. Anyone else? Richard and then Amy. Yeah, I, and I, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about carers as well. I mean, I agree with what you said about respite. It's very important, but obviously the, the role of carers in caring for somebody, particularly um, who's terminally ill and at the end of life, often goes unrecognised. Um, I, I know the committee has heard some of this from us through the, their work on the carers' bill, but I think it's worth reiterating. Um, a live-in carer is the single most important factor in whether someone is able to die at home, which is often what people um, would prefer. Uh, and many of those carers do not get the support that they need. They often are not identified by statutory services, whether that's GPs, social care, uh, as being carers, and they do often do not identify themselves as carers. They simply see themselves as a, a, as a family member, a loved one, a, a wife or a husband. Um, and I think the support that we give carers is really important to ensuring that that good care that the person is getting at home um, is continued and respite care for carers I think is particularly important and that can be just a few hours to get away and um, to get some shopping to to have a bit of personal time it can be a bit of support overnight and um, uh, so that they can get some rest and, and I think that we need to be uh, as as part of this inquiry, looking at the role that carers play in making sure that good palliative care and good care for people um, can continue. Amy? We were Kate talking Trump. to carers as part of the development of our own, um, of our own work that, 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 I, that I talked about earlier. Um, they, they need support in two, two ways. They need support to do their job to do the job of caring and that does include um palliative support uh, you know kind of palliative care that they're providing you know kind of we talked about social carers providing palliative care informal carers are as well um and they also need support to to be themselves to have their own life to maintain their own quality of life um we know that carer stress and the breakdown of the informal caring relationship is the biggest single factor that precipitates um somebody accessing a care home and moving to a care home um and so we want people to be able to maintain themselves at home if that's appropriate for them um, and, and as far as that's their choice. But we want a care home to be seen as a positive choice as well and not something that just happens because of stress. And that means that you need to be able to support the carer as well as the person um, with dementia. In terms of respite, um, our carers are after... Um, they talk about the need for respite. It doesn't take place in a hospice normally if somebody has dementia. It's normally a care home. Um, at the very end of life, as I say, somebody's likely to be in a care home anyway. So the question is almost the other way around as, as, um, and making sure that the carer remains involved in terms of providing their care when the person's in a care home. But when somebody is at home, yes, the carer needs respite. As Richard says, it needs to be flexible. Um, it, you know, kind of, it needs to be a Friday afternoon, not necessarily a week every six weeks. It needs to be a Friday afternoon each week um, to enable the person to, you know, the carer to go out and do their thing, see their friends, um, you know, play football, whatever it is they do. Um, and it, it, in order for them to be able to maintain their own resilience. So, so there's an interest for the system, if you like, in providing respite to, in order for the carer to be able to maintain their own resilience in order for them to be able to keep doing that caring role, which the system really, really relies on. So it is really important. The other thing that um, carers of people with dementia say they'd often like is support to be able to do things with their their partner or their, their parent, the person they're caring for. So it's not respite as such. It's not a break from the caring role. It's But it's support to be able to go on holiday as a family, to be able to have a day out as a family, um, which 
which is considered alongside respite, if you like, and, and can provide the same role. And I think it's important that we think about that as well um, when we're when we're talking about this. So it's care, so it's respite that can be provided at home. It's often care homes that provide it, but it, it, it needs to be able to be provided at home in order to be able to adapt to the needs of the person with dementia and the carer there, I think, um, is, is very important. Again, it's about maintaining continuity if somebody gets confused when they're moved to a different environment then and might start becoming stressed um, and exhibiting signs of stress behaviour. It's important to maintain their security and sense of security. So it's important that that respite can be provided at home. I hope that's helpful. I think just to add to that, again, absolutely, I think respite is really important for people, but again, it's to identify that as early on as possible. Um, and again, with patients, people affected by cancer, it's right across the age spectrum. So it's been really, really innovative in looking at ways that it's not just hospice care, it's not just care homes that are providing um, respite care. It's looking at what really is out there, what we can do, what we can support, the support from volunteers, um, looking at programmes like Helping Matters. So to give that patient, as, as Richard had identified, uh, it might just be a couple of hours um, every other day or a couple of times a week that people need. But again, um, listening to um, patients um, and family from Macmillan, that's the sort of things that they're telling us. They want it identified early on so that it's not becoming just a kind of critical point in um, their care journey. Maria. Annette, can I come back to the, the issue you raised around young people and in terms of respite, there's a, a dual purpose in there that um, it's often mums and dads who are caring for these young people, albeit often with a package of care. So respite for them is incredibly important so that they can uh, participate in life and uh, socialise with, uh, with people their own age. But for the young people themselves, you know, who are often dependent on either mum and dad or a carer's package, you know, it's for a young person in their late 20s to um, have to go to bed when the carers come in sometimes at seven eight o'clock at night or when mum and dad are able to help them to bed that's that's not about us as a society enabling young people who have a life-shortening condition living their life in the way that they should and have I believe a right to live their life so there's something incredibly important about finding creative and innovative ways to find respite which suits them. Bringing young people together who have a condition, they're able to share experiences, socialise together and, my goodness, go out to the pub together, which is what we should be able to support. Uh, and self-directed support can do a bit of that, but for some young people, they like to have some respite together. So there's, we need to work together to find ways to do that. In terms of using volunteers and We've been testing that in CHAS uh, with um, children and families at home, working alongside uh, Volunteering Matters uh, with specially trained volunteers who can go into people's homes and provide practical support. So making beds, doing some cleaning, perhaps making a meal, taking the dog for a walk. Or one of the important things we're asked to, to do is to help siblings with homework. So making sure those siblings are able to continue to um, participate in learning uh, at school and become those uh, wonderful, confident uh, young people that we want and need them to be. So there are different ways in which we can uh, offer respite support. Thanks for that. Um, is there, before, Bob would like to come back in, but, but uh, before, you've already been in, but I'm, going, I'm yeah. in the process of, <laughs> I'm in the process of asking those who have not asked a question if they want to come in, and then I'll return to those who have already asked questions. Nobody. Bob, and then Dennis, is there anyone else? No. Okay. Bob and Dennis then, please. Thanks, I know, I know time is against us a little bit now. Um, last, uh, last week, um, I was asking Professor Clark in relation to the opportunities presented in the Carers Bill, actually, and that, that, that came up a bit today. Um, there's going to be a huge amount of people, we hope, ultimately going to come into the system in terms of getting carers assessments and, and young carer statements, and there, there will eventually be guidance in relation to how, how that's set out and how it's done consistently and quality and training and all, all, those, all those kind of things. Is there an opportunity there to, to be asking the questions during the young carer statement and the carer's assessments and whether or not the person doing the assessment or preparing the statement believes that the carer's providing a palliative or is likely to be in the near future providing a, a palliative intervention on behalf of the family, family member or loved one. And if there is, is that an opportunity 
to consider as consistently as you can start to collect more of that data in a structured fashion. And I'll sneak in a little second thing here. We've mentioned the palliative care register. It's just my lack of knowledge. I'm not actually sure how you get on the palliative care register, which seems a really obvious question to ask. So, and how one could feed into the other. Yep, great. Quick responses to that, please. Richard? Yep, um, as you know, um, as part of the, our response and our um, uh, submission to the Carers Bill, we've asked for um, people that are caring for somebody with a terminal illness to have their uh, care plans fast-tracked. So there will be, a, if that goes ahead and if that's part of what comes out of the Carers Bill, then there should hopefully be an opportunity there for perhaps whoever's filling that plan in to ask their carer what kind of care that the person that they're caring for is, have they been picked up in, say, the palliative care register, um, and uh, that, so there's a really good opportunity there. I think in terms of um, one of the other things we've said about the Carers' Bill is a greater role for GPs in identifying people that are carers, uh, and that is, a, again, a, a good place in which someone that might be um, palliative that's not been picked up gets picked up as well, so there potentially is some crossover there. And as far as I understand it, the palliative care register is um, uh, the GP sort of maintains and, uh, uh, and admits people onto that register. But qualifies, there's definitely an opportunity. What qualifies you for the register? Sorry? What qualifies you for the register? I think it's the GP's decision and the diagnosis, but others may correct me. And I, think, I think ultimately, um, initially it was all patients with a cancer diagnosis went onto the palliative care register. But it's well, yeah. it's limited to cancer. Um, I think, no, it's not. No. But I think there is, a, there is a need for more other people to, to, um, with other diagnosis to be added onto the palliative care register. And people with a cancer diagnosis often, uh, they have multiple comorbidities as well, and they may not die because of their cancer, mm -hmm. but maybe because of other things. And I, inquiries about yeah. it, I and I think it's a great point that having the carers' assessments is a fantastic way, again, to collect that information. Um, and again, if we get this in search of people with, the, with carers' assessments, we need to be prepared as to be able to support these people as well. Amy. Very briefly, I think if you ask the carer whether they were providing a palliative care service, I'm not sure they'd be able to tell you whether they were or not. Um, it, I think that you, it needs to just be a little bit more, a bit, a bit cleverer than that, um, and about the, um, the, the person doing the assessment being able to assess whether the, the care that's being provided is of a palliative nature or not. Um, and that's why it, it's one reason why what happens with the carer support plan as will be and the um and what happens with the assessment of the person's care needs as well um need to be a bit um need to be kind of joined up really in order to be able to identify in order to be able to plan for what future services are going to be required by both thank you Maria. you okay thanks uh dennis Brief as I can. It's on the comorbidity, comorbidity that Tricia mentioned there. Um, something, you know, I, I'm a bit worried that we're sort of going into silos here, you know, dementia, cancer, um, because a lot of people, um, maybe just through ageing process, for instance, uh, have sensory problems because of age or, or mobility problems. People may uh, have acquired arthritis. Uh, there could be heart disease. Uh, it could be uh, the effect of a stroke. Now, other conditions exacerbate. I, I, I I understand that. But what becomes the principal condition that we're caring for? Is it the heart disease or is it the dementia? Is it the cancer or is it the stroke? Maria? Uh, my answer to, to that would be it's the person and their need. Uh, first and foremost, what does this person need and what does this family need uh, in order to to cope with uh, a series of conditions uh, that they uh, may experience over a number of days, weeks, months, or even years. Tricia. And just to reiterate, I would absolutely agree. There's people, people do need specialist input um, for their, their condition specific, but it's about looking holistically at that person um, and their, their extended family as to what their needs and addressing those needs in a comprehensive and coordinated way. Amy. Yeah, what we're concerned about as Alzheimer's Scotland is when somebody's dementia impacts on their experience of care um, or their access to it. Um, and, and when we're trying to overcome the barriers that 
currently dementia creates. Um, but as I think I said earlier on, you know, we're interested not only there, there are people who die of their dementia. There are many other people who die um, with dementia, but their dementia has a significant impact on their experience. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of I can give you statistics around that, but, but time is short. It's, um, it's important that you do look at the person, but that you do therefore look at how the different in, um, conditions have, do have an impact on each other. For example, how the, you know, kind of if the primary condition, if you like, is, uh, is, a, prim is a physical condition, is something like COPD, um, then the psychological effects of dementia are going to have an impact there. So it is very important that, that each condition is looked at and that the particular um, specialised inputs required around each um, are, co are, are brought together and are able to be accessed by a person so that somebody isn't prevented from accessing the specialist input they require because they have one condition, for example, dementia, just because they have another. So I don't think it's a point about silos. I think it's a point about access and bringing it all together and recognising that it's not just about one condition that somebody has. One quick stuff, funding and, and all, all this aspiration has been, you know, how we'd like the world to be. Um, the written submission from Charles writes that, um, that the NHS boards and local authorities will jointly meet 25% of your funding. We had some uh, evidence, uh, just to reflect on that, um, that there is a, around 13.5 of the total cost uh, of NHS funding for Charles is administered through Tayside. And in that evidence session, um, the Interim Director of Finance, uh, Lindsay Bedford, told us that there was a commitment to revisit the baseline and confirm the agreement of hospice running costs. Have they been there yet? Thank you, convener, for uh, <laughs> providing me with the opportunity to discuss this. Um, I'm sure there's a willingness uh, within NHS Tayside to, uh, to meet with us, and we certainly have had a, a meeting planned, which unfortunately had to be rescheduled. We are hoping to meet uh, with NHS Tayside uh, to discuss the, the baseline uh, before the end of October. However, that's a discussion around the 25%. Uh, as you can see in my written submission, there is what I would call an anomaly between the funding of uh, children's hospice services and adult hospice services. And my ambition uh, and my early discussions with Scottish Government are around achieving the 50% of agreed hospice costs, which I'm sure uh, the committee would support. Just we'll broaden it out to that. I mean, I think we, uh, we had uh, some trying to find out and establish what, what level of funding there was for the hospices. And, it, you know, we'll put it polite, it was a, inadequate, the response that, we, that, that was returned, um, you know, on adult hospices in terms of the, uh, the, the, the health boards. Has, has anyone got a response in that? We don't know. Amy? It's just for us, the issue isn't about hospice funding. It's about the access that people... It's about people getting charged for because care tends to happen in the social sector so much more um it's 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 more it's more a discussion around the issues around um around how health and social care funding joins up with each other would be the biggest funding issues i'd like to kind of draw to the committee's attention that you maybe you'd like to think about further yeah. richard i mean um, in terms of sort of adult hospices um funding arrangements are set out by a chief executive letter and it's meant to be 50% but just while I've got my mic on, um, I think it's worth highlighting that all the evidence that, that there is says that investing in palliative care services um, does, um, can be completely uh, offset by the savings that are made in acute services. And you actually end up getting a situation where, uh, for most people who want to be cared for at home, it's their choice and you save money for the NHS. Well, just we, we had attempted, but the information we had, I think we described as inadequate about the 50% target. And I was just wondering if you had any knowledge from your point of view whether that target's been met I would have to check yeah. okay that's good uh, I don't think there's any further questions um, thank you all very much for being with us this morning for this session and for the written evidence which will be helpful to us in this inquiry uh, we know that you'll be watching us carefully in the, in the coming weeks uh, thank you all very much uh, we now go into private session as previously agreed thank you